Way, so we might have to go past that and come back. Firing. 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 All right, how long before we get 007 figured out? I wish I could have left it on the trailer for Gainesville and put the other one in the damn thing. You guys ready? Welcome, everyone. I'd like to call to order the uh, Lawrenceburg Utility Service Board meeting. For March, March the 25th, 2019. Could I get a roll call, please? Board member Tony Abbott? Here. Here. Board member Aaron Cook? Here. Board member, Cook. Here. Board member Mal Davis? Here. Board, Board member Randy Abner? Abner. Here. Board, Board, Board member Paul Seymour Jr.? Here. Utility, Here. Utility Here. Director Here. Olin Clausen? President. City, City Attorney Del Weldon? Here. President, President Kelly Milan? Here. Here. And myself. Okay, okay. any announcements? Uh, one, one announcement. The Lawrenceburg Municipal Utilities Rodeo Team will be competing at the APPA National Rodeo in, in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, towards the end of this week. So, wish them all luck. And that's, that's all I've got, Your Honor. All right. If, if no other announcements, I'll entertain a motion, motion to, to approve, approve the minutes, minutes of the so previous the meeting. meeting. Oh, oh. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Opposed. A motion will carry. Committee report? Uh, no, Your Honor. Not this okay. okay. New, New business. business. Um, I was asked if uh, the city of Greendale has to get to a meeting at six. Okay, to move them up. That's fine. You guys okay with that? Okay. If uh, I guess the first one would be Moosh. I think you're presenting. M O U Greendale Fiber. Thank you, thank you, sir, and thank you, council, for for taking the time to uh, listen to our our request. Uh, the City of Lawrence, or Lawrence Municipal Utilities, uh, a few weeks ago sent a memorandum of understanding to the, uh, the Mayor of Greendale. Uh, and the purpose of the, the understanding was that uh, we would work jointly to connect some of the businesses um, as well as set up a plan to uh, do the City of Greendale with respect to fiber to the home. So, Your Honor, there's, there's two, two key pieces, pieces to this, this, one of which is uh, some, some of the businesses, businesses that are down near the um, racetrack track that are in close proximity to fiber optics that we already currently have installed and be able to provide services to those customers. So it would be uh, one piece of this would be a right to serve from Greendale for those customers on the fiber. And the, and the other would be just, just a formal recognition that, uh, that we are going to work together to try to figure out a way to provide, provide services, services to Greendale. Greendale. Um, um, Mayor, Mayor Weiss, Weiss knows, knows this, and I want everybody else to understand that our first priority is to serve the customers here in Lawrenceburg. Um, but, but there has been a desire from Greendale and, and from Lawrenceburg to, uh, to provide that betterment on a, on a more regional basis. 
And so all so this all really, this really does, does is recognize, recognize our willingness, our willingness to, work to work collaboratively with, with them in terms of grants, grants planning, planning, things, things like, like that, that, so that, so that uh, big, big picture stuff doesn't get missed. Any questions? Yeah, so um, all Lawrenceburg will be able to obtain the fiber before Greendale? What I would, what say, I would is say is if there is a if there is an installation that we have that with with that shutting down work in Lawrenceburg uh, that we could provide in the Greendale area, we will. Like over at uh, Queen City Candy or uh, Bed Tech, those areas. But we're not going to stop work in Lawrenceburg and, and go up and work on issues or hook the customers up in the Greendale area at the cost of hooking up customers in Lawrenceburg. Couldn't the guys that are working at Green W um, looking at other customers in Lawrenceburg? Well, well they, they, they could, could but I'll give you an example. example. If we've got an ATC that's out on a pole, and that ATC on one side of the property line feeds a Lawrenceburg customer, customer, there's really very little work involved in using that same ATC that serves our customer into serving the customer on the other side of the fence line. So the, so the infrastructure that's <coughs> needed to serve that customer would, a, would, would, a, would in essence, be in place. Place. We wouldn't we be going and building, building infrastructure, infrastructure that's specifically, specifically dedicated, dedicated to a Greendale customer. Greendale customer. It's, just it's just maximizing, maximizing piece of piece of piece of equipment, equipment that we have we already, have already there, there that Lawrence is using. Uh, to, add to add to that, that uh, with respect to the residential customers, we will be finishing up all the Lawrenceburg ones prior to entering any new service territories. When will that be? What date? The completion, the completion date? date? Completion. All Lawrenceburg is being served. It's, it's, it's difficult to, to place an, an actual date. I can uh, let you know the areas that they're working in now. And uh, I know there, there's been some delays due to inclement weather and rain. Um, our our goal is to, to have it up as, as quickly as possible. I know that right now they're working in both the downtown area as well as uh, up on the hill uh, toward the, the boundary of Lawrenceburg, uh, Butler, Scenic, uh, Bodie, Primrose, and then um, here in the downtown area we are uh, doing across the street uh, on uh, the, uh, opposite the opposite side of Walnut Street, Street and, and, and moving, moving uh, toward Front, Front Street from there. there. What about, about the free Wi-Fi that everybody's supposed, everybody's supposed to get? When will that be completed? That, uh, that is, uh, will be in conjunction with the fiber build-out. Um, as when the system was designed, we had planned on using uh, the, uh, the modems that we had the purchased, that we had purchased uh, which will, uh, which will uh, project uh, not project only a Wi-Fi wi signal wi for, for the, the, the resident, the resident but uh, separately, separately, it's uh, uh, on another band, band uh, uh, it will project the, the, the free, the free wireless, wireless as well. As well. So, so as, as homes, homes get connected, uh, our, our Wi-Fi footprint, footprint will increase. Uh, that, that does not uh, include the other um, areas such, such as the parks, our street park, park level park, and so, and so forth, forth, where we are planning on doing, doing the free uh, wireless, wireless as well as, well as some of the subsidized homes or subsidized housing. Well, I sort well, of I feel, feel like, feel like I think Aaron's, think Aaron's trying to start point, point out is, is I don't want to fight off more than, more than, more than, more than you. I think we already have because, because this project, project is supposed to be done, done last, last July, July, I believe, was the first date they heard. heard. So, so I would rather, I would rather get, get Lawrenceburg done, done before we, we go into Greendale. I have no problem going to Greendale, but I want Lawrenceburg done first. Understood. I think so also because I've been up on a few times and I see, I see one, one truck, truck and a couple guys, guys up there. there. And I, see I see all the flags, flags up there, there but I don't, don't see any activity. And I know there's a lot of rain and, and a lot of wet stuff, stuff we have up there, there but uh, I don't see well, much activity. Well, 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 back to Butler, Butler everything, everything is done except, except for the drops to the house. house. Mm -hmm. uh, for that particular spot, we are waiting for traffic control on US 48 because there's a splitter box uh, right across the street from Ludlow Park. That splitter box has to go in. Um, um, and then as, as, as soon as, as we install the splitter box, box uh, we, we can go, go ahead and start uh, connecting the customers on Butler. Butler. All the splicing is complete there. Um, we're currently waiting for uh, to get on the um, the traffic, the traffic control, control list. list. Lot, you hear that, you hear a, lot that a lot out there. Talking, talking to people, there's, 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 there
and uh, that's, that's understandable. understandable. And I, and I, 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 well, I, one thing I do want to remind the council is we opened the bid to have the contracting company come in and do this piece of work that we're doing now. And that contract award would have been $1.4 million. $1.9 $1.9 million. And we decided instead of spending $1.9 million, we'd let our own people do that work and save the money, save the debt from the utility. That translated into long time terms, but at the end of the day, they were not going to have $1.9 million debt that we otherwise would have. And this being a new utility, new company that we're starting, um, we felt that that was a better path to take is to not saddle it with the debt, which means lower rates for the customers when they do get hooked up. In addition, our, our line staff are then fully trained to, to build out farther and then we don't need extra contractors. How many, or who's, who's currently running on our fiber? Is anybody currently running on our fiber besides the LCD? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who's that? Uh, we've got the um, we've got a, a few locations on the, on the one, one is, is the, the the antique, antique mall, mall. Okay. And, and the boutique shop next to that. Uh, there's, there's also uh, Hammerlink, uh, which, which is another, another boutique shop, shop on, on all that. Uh, my goal, goal is to to get, to get uh, all, all the customers, uh, the business customers on this street, um, on both sides, sides of the street, street uh, connected, connected and, and just uh, start moving from there. there. Any, any residential? residential? I do I not have any residential, residential right, right now. now. I'd, I'd kind of like to see us wish to get some of the residents done before we move on to another city. Not saying that we don't need to go work with Greendale, but I, I would rather take care of our city first if we can. Well, and, and, I, and I, you know, one of the things that I told Mish, I said, when we bring this MOU up, even though it's just talks about working collaboratively, it's going to be misinterpreted as we're going to go to Greendale. I understand. We have no plans in going to Greendale. We, we, we just want to be able to say that in the future that, that we, will we will work with Greendale, Greendale to solve, solve some of the same, same problems. problems. I'll, 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 I'll just resident have we had people call on asking to be signed up or put them on the list? How's it working? Yes, sir. I, I have a stack of, uh, of folks that have signed up. Uh, initially, when we did the, um, the pre-sign up, I also, I also have customers, customers that have come in, paid their deposits, and are ready to get, to get hooked, hooked up, and, and they're just waiting for a date for the actual hookup. Uh, as, as soon as we get traffic control, we can start, start doing uh, the, 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 the streets, streets that, are that are essentially north, north, north of, of the hospital, hospital. Uh, the Butler, the Scenic, uh, uh, the, the, uh, everything, all the splicing, splicing is done. I just, I just need traffic control to get in my, in splitter my splitter box, box on, on US 48, and then I can start like physically custom connecting customers' homes there. But you, you also need to know who your customers are, and that's what you're doing. You're signing up people now. There is a waiting list. Correct. Correct. I have people coming to me saying, when are they going to get, gonna get well, well, have you called them? Call them. Well, no, no. So, so, so this, uh, I mean, are we doing a good job of advertising the yeah. fact that they need to come in and get signed up and deposits or whatever? Okay. Yes, sir. And even uh, so, so when, when they, they get, get to a particular street like Butler that was ready to go except for the traffic control, uh, I go out there and knock on every door and talk to them and explain to them, you know, what their options are and uh, and if they're interested. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, are you going to make a drop at every house to pick up the metering also? Right now, that is not in the, the plan. plan. Okay. Uh, well, it's in the, the master design. Yeah. But essentially, we're not going to do a drop unless a customer has, has paid for it. Okay. Uh, now, as you know, in the future, when we uh, get more into the automated uh, meter reading and the smart metering, uh, that's a, it just makes sense to do it. Sure. But right now, I don't. We don't have to do a drop to the house. It's all broadcast through. Okay. Through, okay. It's, they all have an individual IP address. All right. And so three or maybe four collectors, three probably collectors in the entire city would pick up all the meter readings for those yeah. locations. I understand. All right. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. First of all, I want to thank all of you. I'm Alan Weiss, Mayor of Greendale. I want to thank all of you for consideration of this. And I want to assure you that I would never expect Greendale to have one customer until all of your customers were hooked up and so forth. That just wouldn't be right, uh, you know. To, 
I was just working with Owen uh, and uh, talked to others that, you know, sure it'd be nice if Greendale had that fiber network in Greendale. A lot of our residents have asked me about it, uh, you know, would like to have something. So my thought was, what does Greendale have to do in order to make this happen? What do we need to do infrastructure-wise? Uh, do we need to train some of our guys? What, what needs to be put in place so when all of your customers are hooked up and, and your system is intact, then if you so desire to, re to expand, that maybe we were ready for that. So we were ready because we'd already worked uh, in, you know, through the months ahead. Just, you know, what do we need to do? And I think that's what we kind of wanted. But before we got that, uh, I thought, I want the green light for my council, which uh, the Board of Works, which they're going to be uh, talking about the same thing tonight. And I uh, thought we'd get permission from you all because if that was something down the road, that expansion into Greendale, after you were all taken care of yourself, that, uh, that then that would give me the green light to say, okay, now what do we need to do infrastructure-wise uh, or whatever it is that we need to do that maybe we can go ahead and get ahead of that and get that done. And that's what the Memorandum of Understanding was about uh, as far as Greendale is concerned. We don't expect to have one Greendale person signed up on this until all of your people are taken care of. That just wouldn't be fair. But as Owen said, if he's got a pole right here on this side of the pole is a Lawrenceburg customer and he can easily hook up that Greendale business, if that's what you agreed to, that'd be great. But if not, we wait until all you are hooked up. That's fine. I'm just looking down the road. We can get a, mem a little understanding that we can, on my part, start moving ahead. And if Owen says you need to have a certain size of poles, we can start planning that ahead. So if we replace a pole, for some reason, we're putting the right size up. Uh, any other infrastructure we need to do to make it happen, we, you know, uh, we just feel like we got the green light uh, for fiber in the future. We'd be making the right decisions now, so we would be ready to go if that time came. So I appreciate your uh, consideration tonight. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the, the couple of customers over on industrial, uh, they potentially could be DIA customers, which is dedicated internet access customers that would be you know our most profitable customers in terms of the utility so it's it's uh i, I don't want to say it, it's in our best interest but it really would be in our best interest to serve those customers while we we're there wouldn't require any additional infrastructure uh, it'd be the simple thing as a, as a drop to those businesses okay. any other questions <coughs> You want something? You want some kind of a? Well, we've got we've got a proposed MOU. I'd like consideration on that. It's really two parts. One of them, I think, is just sending a signal to Greendale that in the future uh, they could expect us to work collaboratively with them. Doesn't mean that they wouldn't figure out a solution themselves between now and then. It's non-binding, really. Um, but also on the in the in the shorter term. Uh, those customers along the uh, right of way between the city limits of Greendale and Lawrenceburg along over in the racetrack fairgrounds area. Just a copy of that in here, Owen. Should have been. No. If not, we can table that until until next meeting. You guys haven't seen it, right? <laughs> Is that still treated as a loan if you start taking it into Greendale? Like what you're doing now, you're loaning money from the electric to the fiber. Is that still treated that way? I, I'm not sure. I don't think that's applicable, that question. Well, how, how are you paying to take the fiber into Greendale, I mean? It's a, it's a utility. It's rate-based. So they pay a rate back to the utility for the service being provided. Well, I'm sure $3 million into the project in Lawrenceburg. I'm just asking how that... When you go into Greendale, does that? Oh, you mean the Greendale city limits? The, if we did all of Greendale? Right. That's the memo. Uh, well, that, that's. I mean, that's. That's so far in the future. Uh, I don't even. I don't even know how we'd talk about that right now. It'd take a lot of planning. We'd have to map the entire system out. See what the see what the the profitability would be. What the rates would be. I mean, there's just a lot of things that have to happen before that. Again, the MOU is it's non-binding. It's just saying, look, we we agree that we'll try to work on some things collaboratively. 
and we we don't have three million dollars debt for the fiber utility it's something much less than that what is it um well we'll talk about some of those things tonight but it's not three million so i just want to make sure we get that accurately captured okay so <coughs> your honor i would ask, table. Uh, make a motion to uh, allow mr nyberger to put in a agreement together uh, between uh, Lawrenceburg and mm -hmm. Greendale. I think they already did that. Did they? Did Mr. Nyberger do it? We, we've know. got a draft it. MOU. It, it's just not in the packet, so okay. we can table that until okay. next meeting. All right. All right. I'd like to see the draft before I vote on it. Yeah, that, no problem. I'd like to, to make a motion to be capable. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion will carry. Thank you. The other item, I think, is uh, Mr. Lampert. Get Greendale chloride update. Yeah, I've been working with Olin and Andy for some time about this issue. It's been a topic since 2005. Um, uh, the prevailing thought was that it was an old uh, gas uh, leaking gas well leaking near Cook Park. Uh, Lawrenceburg hired Egan and Associates in 2017 and performed some analysis and found um, <clears> that was coming pretty much from the Greendale water plant site. Um, we suspect a lot of the um, chloride contamination potentially was coming from just the old operations from the water plant from the 50s and 60s. Also, we did have a, a pipe that was leaking that we found with the Egan analysis, so uh, that did get fixed. Um, Egan's plan was to uh, stop any brine leaks, which was completed in 17, September 2017. We replaced uh, an underground 65-year-old concrete brine tanks that was completed in March of 2018, we're disposed of 3,000 cubic yards of um, brine soil. That was done in September 2018. We also installed four monitoring wells. That was completed in um, February of 2019. So from the recent tests that we've seen, it looks like this work has really helped out uh, reduce the chloride levels. So Andy, do you have any info that you want to present at all? Uh, no, I don't. Um, we're working. We're, you know, working at getting this thing fixed. Um, Lawrenceburg's been at it a long time. We we finally we finally stopped spinning our wheels, spent a little bit more money, and 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 got a good consultant on site and pinpointed all the problem. And Greendale's working hard to correct it now. So now, now we did shut down one well. Lawrenceburg did because of this temporarily. Temporarily. That's for the next question. Will we be able to use that well again, or is this something that stays in the ground? Um, I believe we'll be able to use the well again for um, for certain. How long it's going to be before that happens remains to be seen. But um, part of the Egan plan is potentially to install a, a couple interceptor wells and pump that water to facilitate getting rid of the brine a little quicker than maybe it's going to dilute and go away itself. But uh, we'll see what the, what the next couple rounds of sample results. Looks like a lot of the flooding and up seepage that we had out there really helped a lot. Some of the recent tests showed um, the chloride levels right. were down in the 70s, potentially over by one of the wells, the Lawrenceburg wells. So something, uh, something Mr. Champa, you know, um, shared with us is, is his opinion that uh, the uh, the aquifer, the earth itself, is pretty good at taking care of itself um, if you if you let her do her thing. So we'll, we'll wait and see for now, and then. Uh, We'll we're, we're here to to whatever you know it, it looks like it's an issue that was with us with the, the Greendale so we're ready to help out fix the problem so whatever it takes I know Andy put together um, a cost list of things that you did from 2005 when it first came up yes uh, we've uh, I think we spent upwards of five hundred thousand dollars just doing improvements with the city of Greendale new brine tanks and containment systems um, what else have we done um, uh, just the miscellaneous work with the uh, brine soils that was re removed and sent to Rumpke. Uh, there's just been a ton of work that's been done. I know Lawrenceburg's done a lot of work, but uh, we're going after it, and I think we're really working together trying to resolve this issue. So um, whatever we can do to help out and solve it, we'll do it. That's I think one of the objectives we had was to have Steve here to provide us with updates on a more regular basis as to what's happening there. And so I think tonight is, is just that. You know, you've heard from Andy and I on this issue. Uh, but tonight was, you know, Steve's opportunity to come and kind of talk to us himself about 
you know, the progress that's being made, some of the things that are being done. <coughs> Any questions? No. Thanks, Steve. Okay, thank you. All right, next up, uh, Mr. Weldon, payment agreement. Uh, yes, sir, Your Honor. You should all have in your packet, and uh, Crystal has the original copy of an agreement uh, to end litigation uh, by agreement of the parties in a matter that was uh, discussed at executive session and then approved at the open meeting by city council. And so I think it's most appropriate to have both city council and the utility service board approve this agreement. And we also have a claim uh, for payment, and we'd like to get that paid tomorrow if we could to the attorneys representing the other party in this matter. Anything to add on that? Any questions up here? If not, I'll entertain a motion to uh, initiate payment for the uh, agreement that uh, that you have before you. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Roll call, please. Board Member Tony Abbott. Uh, I'd like to ask one question first before I vote on it. Yes, sir. Um, how does this affect any future cases? It doesn't, and that's the... Because I know we've got more of them that have been discovered. Exactly, and that's the motivation behind the agreement to begin with, is that this ruling would then not be applicable, uh, applicable to other matters. This would limit this uh, settlement agreement to just this matter and no others. So that was the motivation behind the agreement in the first place. Obviously, other considerations were made on both sides, but that's the primary one for us. All right, am I allowed to say anything about this? Uh, you know, just as limited as you can be, but sure. Okay, this is money that was paid to the city, and we're paying part of it back. Yes, sir, but we're paying all of it back. The principal amount that was paid as part of the original agreement, that amount was paid subject to an agreement at the time that reserved that party's rights to then litigate that after the fact they did that um and so this would end the case and pay them back just the amount that they paid so i would expect in any of the future cases we have that we're finding now that we shouldn't be going back billing anymore well i think that's a larger matter but there there really aren't cases that would be substantially similar to this one that yeah there's more coming up yeah. okay i yeah, I think, Councilman Abbott, we deal with those uh, one at a time as we do with all litigation. <laughs> Board Member Tony Abbott was an aye. Aaron Cook? No. Board Member Mel Davis? Aye. Board Member Randy Abner? Aye. Board Member Paul Seymour, Jr.? Aye. All right, motion passes 4-1. to one. All right, next item, uh, Mr. Clausen, Tree Line USA application. So there's been a lot of spirited discussion in this meeting and others about um, trees in the community. And so I met with uh, Mr. Abbott to, to understand some of his concerns about trees and to, to talk with him about this tree line application, which is really like Tree City. So it's Tree Line USA. Instead of the city being the, the forefront as tree, you know, tree City USA, this is the utility. Um, if you look through it, there's some requirements. I think one through five talks about what we'd have to do as a utility to, to qualify to be tree line USA. Um, it includes workers training to properly trim trees. You know, we get complaints sometimes from customers when the guys go in their backyard and trim their triplex or the the service line or the pole or whatever in their yard. They don't really like how we do it. Um, We've never professed to be arborists, so you know this this provides some training so that we can improve on how we provide those kinds of services. And then also, um, it it tells us uh, how we can also participate in planting trees in the community. And there's an obligation here that we work with the the USDA office or the state forestry office in Indiana to identify those trees and. There's some requirement that we'll plant a certain number of trees per year um, and do things to promote, you know, just a, just a, a healthy tree population within the community. Uh, it also has a requirement to, ce to celebrate uh, 
Arbor Day, some things like that. So it's it's $150 to apply for it first time, uh, 75 years every year thereafter. Um, I don't really see a downside to it. I see a lot of <coughs> upside to it. There'll be some training and educational um, opportunities for the employees. And then also a, a way to just contribute and give back to the community as a utility. So if the board would, I would recommend supporting us in this effort. I just want to say thank you, Olin, for looking into this, and I'm behind it 100%. We wouldn't Get some think trees. you wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. Only one, one question, though. Sure. How big are the trees that they'll be planting on the sidewalk? Do we get to... Uh, I, I, think, I think, you know, I don't think they tell you what kind of trees to plant. I think they tell you which ones are best, um, you know, situationally, which ones are recommended. But I, I don't think they're going to say you have to plant, you know, this Lombardi popular and you can't plant this maple or... Okay. I don't think they're going to get into that. I thought we had to purchase it through them. I didn't want to. Well, buy, I don't I know that we have to purchase a tree to go on the sidewalk. No, no, I don't. I don't think there's any requirement that we have to buy a certain size caliper from them either. I think we can, we can kind of do what what we want to do. Okay. Well, I recommend we pass this. I'll make a motion to join the Tree USA program. Get a second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, let's see. The next uh, next item down would be the Mr. Novak Carpenter's uh, building proposal. Wish you help him. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Novak. I'm an architect with the architecture firm drawing department. Our address is uh, 3217 Madison Road in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm here today to talk about the building uh, that exists over on 119 Short Street. Uh, what you see in front of you, if hopefully you all can see this, uh, is a proposal for us to take that building and convert it into uh, the home office and retail uh, facility for LMU. And uh, what you see here is a rendering of what it could look like. Uh, you can recognize the existing building is what you see in gray. I don't know if this mouse is working. The existing building is what you see in gray. Uh, the infrastructure that you see built around it or the rest of the building is to accommodate the program for the business and the retail component of that. Um, this is a picture, but I'm happy to walk you through the plans, which I'll, I'll go to next. Um, <coughs> Anything that you see that's shaded in gray represents the existing building. Anything that is in orange represents new construction adjacent or around that building. So the goal here was to uh, embrace the existing building and the historic nature of it and sort of resurrect that structure with the main entrance being figuratively right in the center of that historic structure and you would enter into that building into the retail component for the utility. Uh, associated with that, we wanted to provide a fully accessible building and one that was also compatible with the activities of the park that are going across the street. So you can recognize over here there is an entrance down at the sidewalk level because the building, the existing building is up off of the sidewalk. And with that, we added an elevator here and we added some restrooms back over here. These restrooms are going to be public facilities also that we can be used in conjunction with the activities of the park that are across the street. Um, so the thought is that this would be open whenever it was, whenever activity was going on in the park. So that is a benefit to the neighboring properties and the park. But uh, this first floor represents the retail component mm -hmm. and our teller desk over here. 
And then this area of the plan represents the offices uh, and several uh, office spaces over here. There would be a drive-through associated with this so that we can pay bills and customers can come through a drive-through over here. Uh, we added two egressible stairs uh, that take you to the second floor and allow us to egress out of this building. But the first floor is the retail and office component for the utility. Um, I'm going to go to the second floor. This is the second floor. Again, you can get there through this elevator or through either of these stairs. The second floor is dedicated completely to employee activity also. So there's a couple offices on this side. There's a large conference room over here. There's a waiting area. This is an employee break area. And this is the manager's office and the assistant's area. Uh, this elevator is what comes up. So most folks would come through this elevator and enter right here so that they could be greeted <coughs> by uh, the assistants, the office assistants. We stacked restrooms up on top of this and you see the stair components carrying up through the building also. Um, <coughs> that's what we need from a business standpoint. Uh, we also suggest on top of this that as an added benefit, we could create an event space that could be used for conferences or in conjunction with things that happen at the park that <coughs> someone needs space. Uh, so this shows that the elevator come, would come up here, the bathrooms would come up here, the stairs would also come up here. But this is a large room that can be seated much like this room or with tables and chairs so that you could have a, a, a meeting or a conference or instructional event up here on the third floor. And those are the three plans that we put together. There is a rooftop area outside over here, so we took the third floor and stepped it back to be compatible with the scale of the buildings that exist on the street, but also recognize that corner down by um, High Street is likely going to be developed. Uh, and thinking about how that corner might fill in, not knowing having the crystal ball, thinking about how that would, would link up to our building beside here, we stepped the third floor back and did provide outdoor space that looked out over the park, which you can see in this rendering is up here. So the restrooms are on the left-hand side? Correct. All the restrooms stack up on the left-hand side of the plan. So if we build a new building and it goes right up against that building, all access is cut off? No, the access for the restroom, sir, comes through this front door. No, he means access to the interior of the building. No, to the outside. He said they're, they're going to be public restrooms, so yeah. do you access them from the front or from the side? From the front. So okay. from Short Street through this opening right here. Okay. You make your way, that's that yeah. opening right here. You make your way through these double doors, and you can enter into an elevator, which will take you up the 34 inches up to the first floor level, and you exit the elevator out the backside. You can use these restrooms here, or you can take the stair that's adjacent to that elevator if you're able. So the restrooms are going to be open all the time? The restroom restrooms. will be open all the time. There are and the park's open. Okay. There are doors on the rest of the facility that are security doors or security points so whenever the park is open these restrooms are available to okay, the addition <coughs> on the right hand side uh, that's going to take the alley that is and correct. part of that parking lot or just the alley it takes the alley and a little bit of the parking lot that's left It'd be a beautiful building for restaurants going in there well the i don't disagree the uh one of the things we talked about is anything that the city built in the future that was on the Jimmy Thomas lot or the Scudder lot, right? Uh, those elevators and each one of those lobbies that you come into on that second floor, those elevators could be used for, for those buildings. So anybody coming in to develop those other sites would have elevators and, and those things there readily accessible to them. So those elevators wouldn't just serve this building, they would serve anything in the future that gets built to the south. They could. I, I think that the location of this elevator also, just knowing about the foundation and proximity to this building, we held it off of this building so that we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't undermine the foundation of what exists there historically. So it made good sense to hold it to the edge of the property. And then, yes, there could be a benefit through here that allowed this elevator to be, be used by adjacent buildings or a building adjacent. 
And you're going to build back behind it also. Is that our property or do we have no, to buy that, that property? That, that's our property. What's back there now is kind of a second addition to that old building. And so we've just kind of clean slated that and said we're going to do staircase back there and storage room, things like that. But that that is this goes to the limits. existing property that's not existing building. And there is more property back here to make your way around this building. But this edge right here is where the current addition is back there, or two additions. Okay, so everybody using that building, where are they going to park at? In the existing parking lot on short, the one we're taking part of? They would park there, or they'd park out on the street, or they'd come through the drive through But we have an 800-car garage down the street. Or a parking garage. garage. Yeah. <clears throat> well, for my discussion, my discussion is I'm not in favor of this simply because that's a prime location for a nice restaurant, bar, whatever to go around our park. And we've had interest for in that building from other uh, developers for that, and that's what I would rather see in there. Uh, number two reason is. We're going to have a lineman's building. We're going to do some lineman building work. And the city of Lawrenceburg owns a lot, half a block, from William Street to Center Street. I don't, can't remember the name of the other little Maple. Maple. We can put whatever you want there for everything. You well, can I, don't, I don't disagree lineman, with you that. You can combine the uh, <coughs> fiber optics. You got room for storage. I mean, you got a whole half of a block that we can't use for practically nothing else because why, of the why dirt. Why can't we use it? Because of the dirt. Okay. So you want to put our people No, we can use it for commercial mail. We cannot use it for no residential. It's still dirt. The dirt's still there. No, Tony, the other thing is, you know, we, 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 we've talked about this in the past. You know, when it comes to having a building and putting people, um, you know, wherever we're at, we're at. But it's been, at least from my understanding, visiting with people is, the same thing that happened when the post office left downtown and went over on 50, it, it stopped a lot of people from coming downtown. We, we're an anchor business. There's a lot of people who, who come through these doors every day that come to downtown, to this area of downtown, that if utilities weren't here, they wouldn't come here anymore. And so as a, as a way to try to keep downtown revitalized and keep it, you know, keep it valid, we have tried to stay in the downtown area, try to, try to keep the traffic coming down here. You know, I don't, I don't, with us being one of the biggest businesses in the city, taking us from the downtown area and shifting us off someplace may not be in the best interest of downtown. I think that's been the discussion. Well, this is a business that's just during the day. You're closed from 4 o'clock on. <coughs> so that does our downtown park area, our downtown entertainment district, which is what we've worked hard to create and to put an office building in the middle of it just doesn't make sense to me right next to our park. <coughs> a, lot of, a lot of people have talked to me about maintaining that building. Once we get that building put together, we still have this building to maintain. And the funding that we're going to have to have, and additionally, even though it's the rate payers, we're all the rate payers going to have to take care of the, the funding on that building. And why don't we just upgrade the building we're in? And that's the people I've been talking to out there. That's a fair question. I still think it's a great idea for us to use that lot, and you can build whatever you want, and you got all the room you need. You got storage and everything there. How many times have we been lucky enough <coughs> to find an owner of the building that's been able to take care of it, been able to have the money to do the upkeep, been able to pay the taxes, paint it? Everybody that we put in these buildings has to come to us for paint money. No, not not everybody, Satch. Not everybody. This is, diff this is a different you, time I now. I sit here quiet. You sit there quiet. You listen to me. We got a guy right now that might be able to take his office, put it in there. I don't know, Ellen. Do you, do you have <coughs> the ability to m do a contract with the rep? I want you, I'm like Tony in one way, I want you to be a utility director. I don't want you in the restaurant business. If you do this restaurant on the uh, partial second and third <coughs> floor, 
Are you planning on running it, or are you no. planning on planting seeds for the park that would have that uh, restaurant in it? And can you talk and elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think the answer to it is um, I would be no more of a restaurant owner than, than Aaron is at the adult center when people use that space. It'd be another space or the fire department when they use that space. It's another space that's available, a space over the park um, that that could be probably one of the straightest arrows in the quiver for the park and you know and and just be a, a building owner that makes people abide by contract issues meaning uh, deposit to use the building costs that cover the cost of electricity and the upkeep things like that and in return there's a space that's affordable that people can use for weddings and receptions or or whatever else because one thing is true <clears throat> when the adult center uses the building after hours when they close they're maximizing that footprint they're maximizing the the usefulness of that building if we design this building in the in the correct way we could have a building that's very useful during the day and could continue being useful for the community into the evening and and at a rate that people could afford to use it and would be i think a benefit to to the park what's the square footage up up on top uh, about 5,000 square foot rooftop. Mm -hmm. That include the outdoor area? Yes. Okay, what's the indoor area square footage up uh, on The top? outdoor area is like 1,400 square feet, 1,200 square feet. 1,400? It's about 1,200 square feet. Oh, 1,200? Uh, you know, I've got another question, something for everybody to think about. I don't know how many times Pat, I don't know if she's in the audience tonight. <coughs> just came to me and said, you know, I'd like to have places to put, you know, put our people to come in. There's no, no <coughs> buildings. Well, here we got an old building. That's a, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's a somewhat of a gym, but it's got its challenges. And, and my question to everybody in this room is, is how often are we going to have an owner walk up to us and do a project like this without us dumping a whole lot of money in it? I don't think it's going to happen. And I do realize they're a utility company, um, but if they're willing to sit here and take part in this community and do it in a reasonable, responsible way to assist in this park, I, I can't sit here and say I'm against it because... I've sit now and watched, I mean, we're the first administration, I think, to do anything with this area. And how, how long have these, we seen these empty lots and we seen these buildings in disarray, Kelly? I, 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 and I think we're trying to make a pretty strong attempt at that. So I commend Owen for the idea. Uh, I'd like everybody to think about it a little bit. I personally think it's a pretty good idea. It's an anchor. We're looking for somebody to jumpstart our park. Um, it's going to be there a long time. How long has the utility business been in business? 1901. Not going anywhere. How many businesses we've seen come and go? Not as many in the last three years. You're right. Uh, I will say, Not Tony, big ones. talking about the, the square footage of just the building alone is about 1,440 square feet, the old building. And it would, it would be very difficult for anybody, including myself, to make that a usable space for a restaurant or, or a business of any kind without adding to it. And uh, I haven't seen too many people come to the city with, with their own cash wanting to put into a building. And so uh, where in 2015 we started setting money aside and, you know, we've got a little over $1.6 million ear tagged for a building currently. Uh, this is this is money that won't raise rates. It's not money that ratepayers will have to pay into. It's rate money that we've already budgeted for and tried to set aside, knowing that at some point we had improvements to do to buildings. And so uh, it won't result in any rate increases for any of the utility customers. It'd be an asset for the utility. And if if there were, you know, a number of businesses over on those streets that were just, you know knocking our doors down wanting to build things there i don't know that i would be as interested in competing with that well there there are businesses that are wanting to go into that building aaron's got a few phone calls from people and and they're just waiting to see what happens with the park 
what the park looks like, and then everybody will be jumping on all those buildings downtown. If I may, I would I would also add to that that at fourteen hundred and forty square feet, with a change of use in that building and just bringing that building up to a, the jurisdictional sort of code requirements for accessibility and bathrooms, you would eat up, you know, at least four hundred and fifty to six hundred square feet within that building to accommodate those needs. Just and in a small building like that, it's. Uh, it's a challenge. You know, <clears throat> Paul, you're talking about the uh, person coming up with the money. Well, it's still the ratepayer's money. It just depends on which hand you pull it out of. It's either the tax money or gaming money for the ratepayers, which we're all the ratepayers. So it's it's either coming out of which pocket you're getting it out of. You understand where I'm at? I understand, okay. but but here's my question to you. Mm -hmm. We've got an opportunity <coughs> to take that money. And, and in your theory, we can invest it in Maple Street or a new building somewhere. It'd be a little more efficient than that building. It'd be cheaper. That's what I'm thinking. But well, go ahead. So I'm, I'm open or, to listen to what you got. You know, I'm just so I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking, <clears throat> what what does the community need? You know, right. if, if we're going to explore the possibility, and I've seen, I, I, he, he's, he has been thinking about these buildings now for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I've seen some renderings. I know and he has. I think everybody has. I'm just looking at that. I'm looking at the park. I'm seeing a little bit of a just high end of the park. Looking at both sides of this, this issue here. It's a yeah. nice building. You know, anybody would want a building. It looks real nice with what he's got there, but I'm just trying to look at both sides of this thing. You know, what, well. the, what the rate payers and the tax. He, he just told us that it wouldn't affect the rate payer. Well, and I think what Andy said is... We're still is using excess <coughs> money that, that we've got there. We could, could we spend it a little more efficiently, you know? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. We could, we could talk about that. Yeah. You know, if a million and a half spent over on Mary Street or a million and a half spent here, uh, it's, it's still money spent. I, th I think the thing I'm wondering about is, um, you know, what... You, you do have a brand new park. And we have a lot of people talking about wanting to be in buildings and do things. Mm -hmm. um, this creates a space that would be usable to anybody, just like the fire station, adult center, anybody that wanted to after hours for a fee, uh, for events that are held on the park. You've got a utility company that can afford to do upkeep, maintenance, oper you know, operational things from, from now on. Um, you know, a responsible landlord, someone that's not going to go away. And the other side of that is, the long and short of it is, I don't, I don't care who it is comes into that building. They're, they're going to be standing at that lectern right there saying, I've got a great idea. Please get your checkbook out and fund me doing my great idea. So if I spend a million and a half someplace else and someone else comes into this footprint, as Ron is saying, eat up half of it just in stairways, they're going to have to add to it to make it usable for a public purpose. Uh, you're going to be footing the bill on that. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's a multiple of two. That's taxpayer's money, too. Yeah. So you have a chance to save a building and taxpayer keep your million and a half that you'd otherwise spend anyway. I would encourage everybody. I mean, I don't know that we need a decision <coughs> tonight, but I would encourage everybody to, to go to <coughs> the old building. I've been in and out many, many a time over the years uh, just to see the challenges in it. Any other comments? No, I just think uh, I'm sitting here remembering that um, there were some people that wanted to throw axes at walls that were in here not too long ago that wanted money from us just to fix up one room to throw axes in. Um, and then have some sort of an escape room. And <laughs> we would still have to maintain the building, but they would be throwing axes at the walls in there, uh, as I remember. So if we can get rid of a building, sell a building to someone that's going to maintain it and get it off of our backs, I think it's a good idea. You know, <laughs> don't forget you're, you're talking about our backs. This is your back. <laughs> it's utility board. 
I'm in the back. There. Oh, yeah. But it's so it's, so it it would still be off the tax on. base. Well, please don't interrupt me, Tony. I'm not interrupting. Yes, Go sure. ahead now. <coughs> the utility pays taxes, and the axe people don't because we still own the building. We, the city, is gaining money. The government doesn't pay property tax. I beg your pardon. <coughs> yeah, they wouldn't pay. Do. They wouldn't mm -hmm. pay taxes. Utilities pay taxes. Uh, oh. But anyway, we don't pay property. If we we can't. There can be pilots payment in lieu of taxes. Public-private <coughs> partnership with a building. Somebody's going to pay taxes. But this wouldn't be public-private. No. What's that? I won't tell them. Somebody, somebody's not going to. The restaurant. Isn't. But this isn't a public private. Well, I think what we can talk about is if, look, if there's. Gonna pay, somebody's going to pay taxes on the top part of that building. They're not leasing it. Well, I think under the, it out yeah, under, the, under the premise yeah. right now, um, it would be a utility building. And, and utilities, they sometimes do pay pilots, which are payment in lieu of taxes. And that's a fee they pay to the city for a use, for a benefit, something like this. Everywhere I've worked, they paid taxes, or in lieu of taxes. In lieu of taxes. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's something we can discuss. I mean, if it's, if it's I, something that's a benefit to the city and they see a need for that, that's, that's fine. I'm willing to talk about any of that. I guess my, my thoughts are, um, say we approved a building on Mary Street for 1.5. This building still sits there, still in the condition that it's in. Somebody's going to come to the city, and whatever number the city decides to fund them at redoing that building or additional money spent. The utility has the wherewithal, has the money budgeted to, to do something at that building, which I think keeps this, this momentum going with the park and, and probably does a lot to encourage or invite other people to invest private dollars in and around the park. And keep in mind there's still a lot of property in and around the park that sits vacant. To build on Maple Street, as best I remember, that's a residential area. I don't know that those people that live over there want all the traffic that's generated over here. I, I wouldn't if I were living there. What used to be there was a junkyard. Not as much, <coughs> now, not as much traffic. My one question, there. is this building in the TIF area, Brian? Hey, Brian. Is, is this building in the TIF area? <coughs> Or the proposed TIF area? It is in the TIF expansion area. Okay. Yeah, now, area. so, and we counted on that TIF area to pay the bond off that we got to do the park, right? Part of it. That's the money we're allowed to use to pay for our bond. The that TIF. The TIF, that's correct. The TIF. Now, so, if they're not paying tax, that's money we lose to pay our bond back for the park we're building. Tony, if we would have given that those other people the building, let them use it, they st we still wouldn't have been paying tax. What other building are you talking about now? I'm talking about that building right there, the gray one. Who's talking about give, letting anybody use it? I want to sell the thing. I never ever said anything about letting somebody use it or lease it. There was a proposal in here last. You, uh, redevelopment. 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 I don't know what went on there. Okay. But, but now listen. They wanted us to white box it so they could have an axe throwing business in there and sell beer. Nobody was going to pay taxes. Did you turn it down? Yeah, we turned it okay, down. Okay, so let's sell it. Who are you going to sell it to? Oh, there's, there's people out there that buy that building now. I want to see them standing right there. Okay, for the, so tonight, um, okay to table it. Yeah, I mean, we're just we're just trying to bring this forward for exactly what we're having a discussion. You know, I think that if 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 it's at least amenable to the group that we have a, a work session dedicated to talking about it and have prints out where people can have it in front of them and mark them up and and have a more meaningful discussion. If the answer is no, the answer is no. But I think tonight is just a you know the purpose of this to give you an update as to what we're looking at. This board voted that we go down this road. And that we develop some plans and that we talk about things and that's I think that's all I'm hoping that we're doing is continue the discussion can I make one little request sure. in this future continued discussion should the groups get together and bring us back information on this pilot or paying because because I'm not I, I'm all about taxes and TIF too 
and I believe you said, hey, we could talk about sure. it. Sure. That that would be one of the big discussions that I'd like to hear. And say, because that building is supposed to be paying partially for our park. So we have to have some kind of That's money coming in from it. Can that be the, a major point of discussion? Yeah, we can get somebody to come in and explain it. Sure. Okay with that? Yeah, fair. All right. Can I get a motion then to table it? That way it gets put on the next we'll meeting. Make a motion we table it to the next meeting. Okay. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? My damn pet back. Thanks, Ron. Motion carries. Thanks. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Novak. Um, I hope I don't pronounce your name wrong. Is this Odneil? O'Neill? O'Neill? Well, I, I want to call you by your right name. What's your name, last name? O'Neill. 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 Building father, it fourth and front. My father goes by O'Neill. Okay. All of his brothers and sisters say, well, he is the odd one of the family. So yeah, we won't say there. that about you. Thanks for your, your time. Uh, my, my program closed on... <clears throat> Um, so I'm here today to, uh, as just an update on, uh, we, we were, uh, I'm with SSOE, engineering firm. Uh, we work for the utility quite a bit. Uh, we were asked to uh, look at uh, some space for a new lineman's uh, office since they were removed from 106 Front Street where the data center goes now. Um, and um, through our investigations, we we're considering three sites: uh, the existing Walker Street site, um, Tanner's Creek site, uh, where the pole storage yard currently is, and then a, a site on Industrial Drive that I believe is now a, a gym, fitness club. What we have for you today is just uh, site plans and floor plans that uh, we developed so that we could uh, develop a cost estimate for these different options. And the cost estimate uh, is expected to be done uh, in the next couple of weeks around the middle of April. Uh, and at that time, then, we'll make another presentation to the utility board. And hopefully the idea was that you know, we can decide what path we want to go down, if we want to go down any of those paths or, or whatnot. So I'll try and be quick and walk you through, uh, through these <coughs> sites. So what you're looking at here is uh, the existing uh, block there with the big the big gray area in the middle is the substation. This is the existing Lyman garage and the 106 Front Street data center now. Uh, the, the area in red is the existing metering building, which uh, really needs condemned. So we're considering uh, removing that building. And then in this option, uh, building a drive from Front Street down to the level of the line garage. And then we're also considering adding a two-story addition to the end of the line garage for the lineman's office. There is a gas easement here. This kind of takes away the existing drive between the fire station and the line garage. And we show a drive between the building and the fire station, but uh, this was kind of our orig the original, hey, let's put a building there on the end, but, you know, I think our initial thoughts are this is kind of like putting 10 pounds of stuff in a 5-pound sack. The site is very uh, space-limited. In fact, uh, 
really none of the garage doors on this side of the existing line garage are usable because the line trucks just can't make this bend to get out to drive onto the street. And the net on the back of that sheet is uh, the proposed floor plans. I'll just go over this quickly and won't go over it in the other options because it's basically the same same space. There's uh, room for offices, uh, lunch room, um, large lockers for their equipment and uniforms, showers restrooms, uh, a gym or workout area, and then some sort of uh, indoor workspace. Like classroom or? Uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a large conference room here that we envisioned would have, you know, a big monitor similar to this on the wall with, with uh, pull-up system maps and whatnot. The next option for the existing site was because this site was so congested, we thought, well, if, if we could acquire the property next to 106 Front Street, you know, that would give us room to build a drive off of Center, Center Street there. Um, to, to access the site and then we, this site this plan again we would tear down the metering building and kind of build the new two-story lineman uh, building there um, but then again we would have this whole newly acquired property if we wanted to move it there <coughs> um, both of these front street sites um, don't take into account the much needed warehouse space um, <coughs> I would probably uh, require developing the, the second story in the line garage. They have a kind of a canopy. Mezzanine area. Mezzanine area yeah. that we would have to extend out another bay um, for, um, I don't know if any of you guys have been down there lately, but all the fiber stuff coming in, I mean, they, they just have, materials everywhere so like days like today when it was raining with all the trucks in there and all the materials in there they were out of space in that line garage already so uh, so that's that option and there would be a, a, a floor plan for that that building again the same same spaces um, and then the next two options are just kind of dreaming looking outside the box uh, we heard that there was a property on industrial drive that might be available so we threw a, a plan and a line garage on on that property uh, who knows if it would be available or or not but just something to think about And then the third option <coughs> would be on the other side of the levee wall. Um, there's a, a site that the utility has uh, their full storage yard on now, and the site needs some improvement um, due to uh, some ash runoff. And we were just thinking if we were going to invest some money there to cap the site, maybe we could invest enough money to improve the site to actually build on it. So um, that's looking at a new uh, lineman. We, we've talked about this site in the past. <clears throat> uh, James Alvarez is here tonight to talk about the closure plan. So we, we acquired this site from Seagram's and uh, I think we got it for a dollar, but now it's mandatory that we close it. And so closing it has a cost that is unavoidable. There's, it's going to be $500,000 plus to close it, do the capping and all that. And so 
our thoughts were if, if we have to spend five hundred thousand dollars to cap a piece of property and do some things with it if we put another two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand into it would we have a lot that was usable for construction instead of just having a closed landfill um, I personally don't like the idea of having to spend five hundred thousand just to close down a piece of ground and then walk away from it so if it were usable after the fact it might be a good investment for us <clears throat> so again here's just a, a floor plan uh, that includes both warehouse space and line garage space and then an office building on that property and then the last two or last sheet or two of your handout is just an alternative uh, looking <coughs> layout and building for that same same space I have one question is this the same type of ash that's over at I&M now that they're dealing with um, Jim can talk about that we, if we can hold those kinds of questions till Jim's presentation he, he'll be able to tell you about that this is all the the ash from the old Seagram's building or the Seagram's uh, distillery <laughs> so I think it's a, I think it's a little different in nature uh, it's still a problem there's areas of it that are eroding and there's stuff that is washed into Tanner's Creek and so um, ultimately like I said we got it for a dollar but it came with a much higher cost than that of ownership so. oh, also yeah. uh, on this we, we build this up enough to get, get it out of the flood plain well it currently it sits it currently sits about a foot higher than the city garage okay. and so it's it's actually I don't know how it got that way but it's okay. pretty high already okay. uh, by the time we capped it it would be a couple feet higher than that um, again just trying to maximize a cost that we we're required to close it and so thinking about you know having to spend that money you know would it would it make sense to spend a little more and have a usable piece of property so that's kind of where we're looking at it your plan is to bring back cost figures for each option right and of, of course you know the, the floor plans and and lay even the site layouts are just so we can come up with a cost based on something so not held to any of these plans or or layouts Okay. So no action needs to be done on this. No. One. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. I think you're up next. Yep. And then next, I just wanted uh, to give you an update on uh, <coughs> what uh, Lawrenceburg uh, Electric Utility is doing over. Uh, at the fairgrounds behind Queen City Candy and for the city of Greendale. <clears throat> um, if you can, I didn't have a handout on this, but if you, if you can look on the uh, screen, um, this pole line is existing. It goes along the fairground property. And um, in order to provide Queen City Candy with their power needs, um, Greendale, which Greendale could not meet, um, we are we rebuilt this line and are reconducting it. Uh, that's in in that construction is in the process right now. It's probably 80% complete. And then uh, from one of these poles here, we're going to feed uh, Queen City Candy and then a feed to tie into Greendale's industrial park. Um, all at 12,000 kV. Uh, if you don't know, Greendale's existing system is 4,000 kV, which is a lot less uh, voltage. So they're looking to upgrade their system and their industrial substation, and we would be providing them uh, electricity to that area while they, so that they could rebuild that area with and keep all those customers live uh, we would be metering <coughs> at the pole here um, well Jim if I can I'll sure. stop you there the just like Lawrenceburg um, Greendale has a contract with IMPA where all their purchase power has to be directly with with IMPA and so we're we're still trying to work through the complexities of how we'd serve that load meaning do we have a contract where um, 
we're displacing that power through some some relationship with IMPA and and they they in essence bill the customer and then give us our percentage or however that might might work just kind of like we do with rainy wells now if you're familiar with it <clears throat> but or or we may serve them we may set our own meter there and serve them until what time Greendale has the capacity or the wherewithal to serve them and then we'd give that customer back to Greendale uh, the important thing to understand is Greendale is going to pay for the cost of, of this project. There won't be any cost laid out by Lawrenceburg for it. So there won't be an issue where we have a stranded cost or, or anything like that. <clears throat> We'd get the benefit of the transaction for whatever time we serve the customer. And so it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's, a, it, it's in the right spirit, it deals in the right spirit, meaning you know, to help Queen City stay in this area, keep those jobs here keep their investment here um, I think it's great we're working together uh, but it's it's really the, the the there's some nuances in the the metering side that we still have to work out with IMPA <coughs> Steve is there any uh, is, is there any uh, <coughs> anything else Greendale wants to pay for tonight <laughs> <laughs> no, again I want to thank Lawrenceburg for helping us out with this Queen City Candy came to us and said well we're thinking about packing up all of our marbles and leaving and going to Texas and then all of a sudden they came back and said well we're gonna pretty much just double the size of our plant and our substation back there it doesn't have the wherewithal to do it so I've been talking to Olin uh, Jim about uh, giving us a metering point to allow us to be able to serve Queen City through you all as well as while we bring our 12 kV express line up from our new Valleywood sub up by the roses so it's a, it's a huge help for us um, while we're doing this just like Jim was saying <clears throat> they'll connect into on Rudolph way uh, while we're doing this uh, we'll be taking out the old industrial sub it is a 4 uh, 34 5 to 4 kV sub we're going to completely do away with that and we're all uh, which is a whole lot of fun converting from 4 kV to 12 kV and I know y'all did it here and it's it's a nightmare but uh no it's fun Steve it's fun <laughs> okay but uh this is really going to help us out a ton uh, with that metering point um, by the time we get the industrial sub up and running we'll have our La Rosa or excuse me our Valleywood sub uh, to back it up and uh, again it's just a win-win and uh, again I can't thank you enough uh, for helping us out with that Thank you. So I think what we're looking for tonight is, is, is an okay from this board to allow us to continue doing the things that we're doing and, and formally work out an agreement with Greendale to provide service to Queen City Candy during the interim, whatever that time period is. Can I get that in the form of a motion? So moved. I'll second that. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Emotional carry. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I won't say your last name. Uh, Mr. Clausen, LMU and UTC agreement? Yeah, I'll turn it over to Greg Nybarger. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of things um, on the agenda tonight. Two, um, one is a pull attachment agreement with CenturyLink. I believe you have an agreement in your packets. We've been no. negotiating with CenturyLink for... We don't, Greg, we don't have the agreement. You have the original. I have the original. Uh, I don't have yeah. that. Um, the hell? <clears throat> well, we have, we've been negotiating an agreement with CenturyLink for, let's just put it this way, uh, a while. Uh, it's been a little um, difficult trying to reach um, agreement with them, but what we ultimately did was pulled, I think, 12 or... I think about 12 different people to try and pull in their legal which is uh, a much larger entity um, they're kind of local guys and um, some of our guys to come up with an agreement on how we're going to deal with pole attachments and this is a big issue for us because as you know you're going through this uh, park project and you're going to have uh, issues about uh, assigning costs to each different carrier uh, for what has to take place, whether, you know, first thing is moving everything up to the carrier space <coughs> on each pole so you have communication space, and then being able to deal with everything else as it as you're moving through the process with the park project and just in the regular process of updating poles. Um, since you don't have the agreement in front of you, you have two options. You can give um, the authority to sign a pole attachment agreement, which I've reviewed and approved and has taken 
considerable time uh, to negotiate and give Mr. Claus uh, an authority to sign that, or you can table it uh, until your next meeting so you can have a chance to review it. And either one is fine with me. But I want you to, at least all of you to understand, we've been able to actually reach an agreement. And I think that that poll attachment agreement, when you'll, when you'll see it, should form the basis for your future agreements with all your other communications providers, your Comcast in the future, your Cincinnati Bell in the future, because you want to have one uniform agreement, right? Because the way that the problems that we're having now um, in assigning costs and getting carriers to deal with those costs and reimburse us for those costs is every single agreement is different. And so you have to literally piecemeal every discussion out with every carrier every time you need to tell somebody to, you know, make ready costs are coming, get off our poles, you know, we need your help in, in completing this project. So it, it becomes um, a task that becomes a, a, a major mountain. So what I would submit to you is we have an agreement with um, CenturyLink. I will make sure that it gets emailed out to all of you so you can see it and consider it probably best would be for the next meeting. Um, this is going to help form the basis for how we're going to attempt to recoup, make ready costs from the various carriers. And that's important that we do it in a unified way make sure that we're fair and equal to all the carriers as best that we can. So that's, that's the first one I would tell you, and I apologize that it's not in your packet, but I will get it emailed out to all of you so you have it um, and you can look at it. Um, the, the second issue is, you know, you're coming online with this fiber, um, and there's an issue um, in the, the basement. I think you heard Moosh talk uh, a couple months ago yeah. about um, Cincinnati Bell has some equipment in the basement of the data center, and what we've run into is a problem because you want to use that space for your backup battery and your battery power in the event that there's a problem and there's not enough space to get that done. Um, the agreement that's with Cincinnati Bell allows you to politely ask them to move out of the basement if there is a need under the agreement, a municipal need for that space, and there is. And I know Moosh and Olin have tried to figure out several different ways to come up with some alternative, but this is the most cost-effective uh, way of dealing with the problem. In, and that's to be able to move them into the data center, which makes the most sense anyway, right? Get, get all their equipment, get all their needs up in the data center, and then we can actually utilize that space for what I think it was intended to do, which is use for battery space. So with that, I would submit to you what I'd like to have the authority to do is you to provide um, Mr. Clawson and direct me to negotiate with uh, Cincinnati Bill for the use of that space under the existing agreement. Any questions on that? Comments, questions, guys? Yeah. You just need a, a motion to give you, uh, get, get Mr. Clausen the authority to direct you to, to negotiate that. To negotiate and bring back a final agreement for approval. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, one thing I want to touch on, <clears throat> Mr. Richardson, you brought up the $3 million earlier on the debt. Uh, when we started the fiber project, we were required by law to send notices out to all the people on our poles um, in, in a certain amount of time, which we did. Um, they were supposed to comply and move their stuff off of the poles and, and save us the cost of having to do that. Well, in essence, they didn't. And we've talked about it in these meetings how those costs significantly drove up our estimation of costs. Part of this agreement is to help recoup some of those costs. So while we've been tracking those costs as a utility uh, infrastructure cost in, in terms of make ready. We've had to do that so that we knew what costs we were going back after these carriers for to reimburse us for the work that we did on their behalf. So when we talk about $3 million debt, it's not $3 million debt. It's something much different than that. So just wanted to make sure everybody understands why this agreement is so important. Greg, do you have any, uh, off the top of your head, do you remember what the Pole attachment cost is going to be not not counting the make ready cost, just the pole attachment. The, the rate in Lawrenceburg was something in the magnitude of eight dollars, even I believe, and it's going to what is a much more competitive rate of twenty one dollars, um, which, which makes sense, right? I mean, you, you really need to be able to recoup all the costs that you're having outside of make ready work and other right. work through your rate. So when you're going from an eight dollar rate to a twenty one dollar rate for your carriers for pole attachments, and the, the way that the um, current CenturyLink agreement is um, set up is it's a joint use as well. So it gives each party the right to kind of use and attach to each other's poles, which, you know, if, if you need it, you really want to have, right? Um, so that's where we're going. You're heading in the right direction to be able to 
make sure that you're recouping the right types of costs from the right types of, care, of, of communication providers on your poles. And that's what you need to do because, you know, as your system ages, you're going to need new poles. You're going to have a whole bunch of costs. You need to bring your costs in line with the market. And that's an annual or a monthly? That, that's an annual, annual, and we used APPA's methodology for establishing pole attachment costs. And that's per pole annually? It's per pole, and it, and it aligns with yep. what you see as LMU costs for those poles. Okay. It does. It's based off of our actual costs. Uh, and, it, and I will give an example. I think Duke's 28 to $32, so we're below that. But we just take the methodology that APPA suggests for pole attachments. And we just plug numbers in, and it kind of tells us if there's two attachments, three attachments, this is what the rate should be. And we have to be pretty uh, uh, precise about that because they could obviously they could challenge it, and it would be challenged at um, IURC. Could be if you don't have an agreement. Yes, that, that is so. one one uh, area left to the Indiana Utility Regulatory Commission if you can't agree on a rate for pole attachment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Okay, Mr. Talkers, looks like the Scenic Ridge Subdivision Utilities. Hello, I'm Jeff Talkers with Land Consultants. Um, we last month got approval for a 18 lot subdivision on Scenic Drive in Dearborn County. And the owner uh, is Jack Moss. He'd like to do this as a fairly high end subdivision. It's 18 lots on 53 acres. Uh, but he doesn't want to do it unless he has utilities to it, so sewer and water, uh, fiber. So what we're requesting is, is whether the City of Lawrenceburg or Municipal Utilities will be bringing someday in the future utilities up Wilson Creek Road <coughs> or whatever direction to get the scenic drive because uh, the plan is that uh, we get the <coughs> primary plot approved, but we will not go to construction unless we have current utilities and especially sewer, gravity sewer. So the site right now is designed to have gravity sewer go down to the lower south corner of the property and collect um, in some type of large manhole to be able to be tapped into a future pump station, force main, gravity line, whatever comes up the road. So just wanted to inform you that we got our end approved in uh, Dearborn County and we're just kind of going to sit and see what the utilities folks would like to do for the area. <coughs> but this would be somewhat of a catalyst for the area because it's basically uh, an average of three acres to the lot with sewer, which is real rare for, for a single family development. How many structures, Jeff? 18. 18, 18. 18 homes. Um, we would have to do some work on Scenic Drive at that 90 degree turn. We'd actually have to cut the grade down a little bit so we had better sight distance. Okay. But all that was worked out with Todd Listerman. So technically, we can build it uh, as an engineering position, but um, <coughs> we don't want to build it with without sanitary sewer. Is he willing to pay the cost of the sewer extension to do that project? He's willing to pay the cost of the sewer in the subdivision, but not the extension. So to give everybody some ideas of what we have there, we currently front the property with electricity. And we also currently have our low pressure forced main adjacent to the property, out front of the property as well. The problem with that is, and I think Andy could talk a little more about this, is it's limited in, in capacity. So one of the, one of the things that we talked about is if we, if we have sewer run down there, do we have an obligation to serve? If we do, how do we, you know, how do we, how do, we do the improvements to those areas? Uh, the other issue is, I think it's an LMS water line that's down there, and I don't believe LMS can provide you with fire flows for those areas. Correct. And so, uh, while I'm not advocating that we take LMS's territory, I'm just just telling you what the reality is of the property. Jeff, didn't the developer present to the county that they already have our approval to run sewer to the property? Did I present it that way? Did the developer present? No. Wasn't that part of their... The developer, part of their agreement and, and their approval in the primary plat was this development would not be built unless LMU brought utilities to the site. Isn't this what we've been working on with the annexation project with American Structure Point? Uh, annexation would, I mean, if, if we serve this piece of property, say we served it with a low-pressure <coughs> system that's there, 
every one of the lots, the property entirely would have to sign remonstrance waivers because we're providing sewer. Doesn't matter if it's gravity or forced main, or low pressure forced main, they'd all have to sign remonstrances from annexation. But wasn't that the purpose of having Structure Point put that project together? It Haven't was, you already been it in was talks a, with JTM? It was a, that was a much broader project. Um, they were, they didn't work congruently, meaning they were working on their project and we were talking about annexation, but it wasn't because we were talking about annexation that they were talking about their project. Uh, we found out about their project while we were talking about those things. And so um, we have met and talked about synergies, but that's pretty much the extent of it. And wasn't that the 70% rate increase that one way part of that was this project, the annexation project? <coughs> We had a rate increase that talked about annexing and sewering a lot more property than just this. So, do we have a, you, you have a cost on this? What the extension would cost go on. Well, if all of it flows gravity to the backside of the property to a wet well of some sort, where we can pump over a, a consistent amount over time, uh, it would be you know Andy and I have to look at it to see about extending that low pressure to that point. Um, but it's to the it, bottom. It, to it'd the be bottom dealing with just that piece of property. Well, the the low pressure sewer <coughs> is already it's already there. It's just not large enough. Um, if if all the lots had <coughs> had low pressure uh, sewer pumps and hooked to a low pressure system, there would be some upgrades still necessary. They wouldn't be as extensive, but uh, the developer is desiring to not have pumps at each lot, which most homeowners would appreciate. Either way, there's upgrades to the low pressure. Um, the only way that it can ever happen, gravity, is if that annexation project that you're talking about, which encompassed a lot more than just you know the ability to serve Scenic Drive with gravity sewer. Um, it was 148, everything from the country club out to the Y, basically. It also included a consolidation of five lift stations or pumping stations that we have up off of hardwood and a number of different things. It, was, it wasn't just strictly an annexation. It was an infrastructure proposal. And any one of those individual proposals is still like the, like the consolidation of those five lift stations. Those are things that we should be talking about because of the reduced cost to the customers and uh, an increased uh, you know, ability to serve those areas. Um, many of which, you know, some of you guys represent. So, some of those projects are still still worth talking about. There's no timeline for the owner to want to build this. It's going to pretty much wait and see what happens with what you guys are going to be doing with utilities. But uh, Dearborn County Sewer District's on board because this could solve issues in the area if there was some type of sewer coming down. But Jeff, would they be willing to, Durban County, would they be willing to participate in the cost of the project? They talked about just, <coughs> they would have to be some kind of interlocal agreement. So they were open to that. And they basically wrote a letter to the county saying, we, you know, we'd be open to whatever happens on the design side and how we can work together. So it's, it's to me, more of a future thing, but it's something you got to look at, I guess, because those sewer issues have to be solved. And uh, this might be the starting point, I guess. Where does the money come from if we do this? Is it the municipal fund, or are we going to bond it? Or I think what we would probably talk about is, is uh, you know, where it makes sense to, to partner with the county like we did on, on Wilson Creek, Upper Wilson Creek. We partnered with the county. The county did the entire project. As soon as that's done, they hand it over to us. We own it, maintain it, charge a rate plus a rider. Rider goes back to the county uh, indefinitely, or if we ever annex, then we pay them off whatever still owed to them in terms of what the project cost was. And so I think there's I think there's several different options to try to do projects like this. Um, I, I think that if anything did come a value of that study with American Structure Point is just looking at a map and seeing what makes sense to you know for for long range and short range planning. Uh, stuff that we might be interested in looking at in areas that we might want to develop for our own mutually beneficial reasons. Expanding the city footprint, higher tax base, 
or more tax base. This wasn't in my uh, things either. like that, adding customers to the to the system, which helps you know stabilize and reduce rates over time. So there's a there's a number of reasons to look at that, not just in that area, but you know anything that, that borders Lawrenceburg, we ought to be at least talking about or having it in some planning process. Whether it ever happens or not, we should at least be talking about it. So yeah, this is just really a presentation to show you what we've gotten approved and for you guys to discuss it and know that there's a piece of property out there that you know the owners willing to develop I think in the pretty high-end subdivision and hopefully in the near future he can jump on that opportunity thanks thanks Jeff okay next item is uh, mr. Whitman LWR update good evening um, my name is Jack Whitman, and um, I'm a groundwater <coughs> scientist and uh, hydrologist. I work for the, a company called Intera. Intera is one of the oldest groundwater modeling companies in the United States. We've been around since the 70s. Um, I've been working in the state for over 25 years, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the well fields and uh, the risks that are related to the coal ash storage we're all familiar with. Um, the questions that I looked at, the two that I think are the most critical is where is the groundwater that's going into the wells moving from? And how, how, so where is the water coming from that you're pumping in the, in the wells? And is there a risk from of, to those wells from contamination from the Particular. This is a little bit hard to read, but these are two maps. The one on the right shows kind of in red outlines where the coal ash storage piles are. It's not meant to be, ex that's, that's what I had to work with when I was doing this work, and it just shows where the storage areas are. And the one on the left shows where the wells are that are pumping. Um, they're on both, but the the colors are different for a purpose. They've got that one red well is <coughs> a industrial well. That's the one for the power plant. And the, um, the orange-ish wells are all industrial wells. Those are for the distillery. And then blue ones, which don't show up very well on this image, are the municipal supply wells. So they're kind of scattered. You've got everything from the Greendale to the north and uh, LMU, and then you've got other utilities, LMS wells and Aurora further to the south and, and uh, west. So these these are this is kind of just the setting that I dealt with, and um, the question, the way I I like to look at this is that it's kind of a water budget question. So first of all, I wanted to know, is there enough recharge going on to the aquifer to satisfy all these wells? Is the water basically, does it, have, does it come from how much of it comes from the Ohio River? And I looked at that, and there, uh, based on the estimates that have been made in the area, recharge isn't enough. Some of the water does come from the river that satisfies the, the, the well field. And so, I looked at that and looked at all the different users and you know, estimated that there's some amount that's coming from the river towards the, the <coughs> wells that are pumping in that aquifer. Um, I built a groundwater flow model to look at the, um, the whole problem and tr trace the path lines for all the wells. And this just shows the grid that's used to to create the model, and I inside of each of the boxes in this grid, there's a, an aquifer property is assigned to it, recharge rate is assigned to it. Along the river, there it's given its own properties of having water in it and re some resistance to the aquifer, some hydraulic resistance. So all of that's included in the model, and this is the area. The, and you can see that the model doesn't extend all the way up the, 
the river, and that's actually conservative in this case. That forces more water to come from the river rather than from up that valley. But I thought that was a reasonable uh, simplification. Um, and if you look in cross-section at this area, we varied the aquifer base because the aquifer isn't the same. It actually goes up as it and thins as it, you know, the bedrock along the edges of the system. So that's a part of the model that's included in this assessment. Um, and when you run the model, this is the these are the the contours of the groundwater surface pumping in this area. And what it really shows, I think more clearly than you see in, in very many other places, is that the big Ranny collector well that's at the distillery dominates the flow system. It's really, everything else is pumping around that big well that's pumping six-ish million gallons a day out of that one big well. So what you can see is that that dominates and that also is important in that it creates a divide. There's nothing, no water really is going past that. You can't get water from the riverside through past that and get around <coughs> to the, the uh, LMU wells that are just behind it. So it's really important to understand that that feature is one of the key features of the aquifer in this area. And it really answers the big question of, of can contaminants move into these wells? And the answer is no, because of that well. That well is, is a dividing line, basically. Um, so the next slide here shows the capture zones of the well. This is, these are not for time of travel. These are where the water comes from for those wells if everything <coughs> stayed at their average conditions. And I just used uh, 2017 numbers for pumping rates. And um, in general, you, could, you can see that uh, the wells that are to the north of that big, uh, I guess this doesn't, the cursor doesn't show up, but that big collector well basically forces all of the water from uh, north of that to come from further north. Um, so it's, it's useful to, to look at that. There are questions about exactly the, the uh, relationship of the hydraulics of Tanner Creek to the aquifer along its reach. That could be something that would be, could be looked at. But basically the answer is, is fairly, um, it's unambiguous in terms of risk. It's a very um, clear indication that the wells are getting their water from a different direction than many of these uh, storage, ash storage piles. Um, that's, that's really it. And, and I would like to answer any questions if you have them. I did a, a lot of work to, to pull this together and I'd be happy to, to answer questions. Yes? Yeah, my, my question is, is, as a community, let's say Aurora, Greendale, Lawrenceburg, should we be uh, you mentioned we've got quite a few wells. How many more wells should we let go into this area? And is there any type of a, I don't know that, that we have any kind of, of permitting or <coughs> allowance process that we're using right now. I mean, should we be worried about people just coming in and putting wells in our area? Yes, yes. Um, the, and, and the problem isn't that they that that causes a problem the problem is is that you don't know what they just did to your capture zones <coughs> where your water comes from so a, a bunch of new wells this whole all groundwater flow in this area is defined by where the wells are pumping period it's just a it's a it's it's determined by the well fields and and by their pumping rates so new wells will change that picture, will move those capture zones. 
you don't want that to happen without a conversation at least beforehand and maybe running this model again with those new wells put into it to say, oh, that's a good idea, that's not a problem, or maybe we should move it a little bit to the east or west based on what we can see. So there needs to be some regular conversation interaction between the water users in this, in this, this aquifer. It's a normal thing. And it's also very much in keeping with the theme of the meeting this evening. You know, it's really, it's, it's the conversation between these communities and the water users, and it doesn't have to take place here, but somewhere there's a meeting among those people to just talk about what, what they've seen, what they've been doing. <coughs> and there's also a lot of monitoring wells out there. There need to be probably more <coughs> water level measurement, measurements as well as water quality to manage the aquifer. So right now, it's a bunch of individuals working to produce water. That's what everyone's doing. And what, it cha what needs to change is there would be, needs to be a, the same group of people talking to each other to manage the aquifer that they're all using. And that's not that complicated. No. <coughs> Jack? Yeah. Uh, Sort of north east of here, mm -hmm. uh, we run into Ohio. Right. Okay. Should they be involved in that conversation also? Because when I was director, I was more worried about what went on in the Whitewater, the Miami, that area, because it comes this way. I don't think there's any reason, because this is informal. This isn't a legal entity of no, any understand. kind. So I yeah, I think yeah. it would make sense. The neighbors should, should speak to each other. I think that's a healthy thing, especially for the purposes here, which is really protecting everyone's long-term water supply. So yes, I don't think there's any harm at all because they're your neighbors. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that I had suggested in talking with Jack, we've been, we've been working on this for some time now, um, you know, we've been relatively quiet on the issue simply because we wanted to make sure when we talked about these things publicly that we that we we knew the things with enough uh, facts to be able to talk about them uh, with authority and to, and to let people know where we stand with things. One of the things that we suggested is that we that we reach out to the other communities and we form a uh, and you know or develop an MOU of some sort that when wells come in to Lawrenceburg, we let the others know, or if they come into Aurora, they let us know, uh, just so that we can be aware of what's happening. Uh, there's enough water coming to this area that I don't know that a single well is going to change the long-term picture, but it could affect a user, a particular user, in some way. Um, I'll give you an example. The chloride wells are the issues that we had. We, we stopped pumping well three. And we did that so we didn't pull the chlorides more that direction to, you know, and contaminate that well to, to, a, to a higher degree. Uh, those same kinds of issues, you know, it, it just makes sense that we're talking about it as a community so we can avoid those kinds of things. Um, and so we can, we can monitor water quality and, and, and just have a more accurate, fluid picture of what's happening in terms of one of the most precious resources we have in the area. Are you saying that we have enough monitoring wells out there now or not? Well, the fact is I, I know of where most of them are, but I don't know where all of them are. And I think that they're located in places that made sense for the utilities, each of them. But I think that monitoring could, could be expanded for a, no matter how many you have and improve the total understanding of the system. Then w that way you don't have to simply rely on a model. You can look at the data, and you can make sure that they go together, because there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions that are inside the model that always have to be checked against the real world. So good point. And, and Mr. Carr is uh, yes, sir. He, he's a, he's also does a lot of this hydrology. I think maybe you want to speak. Yes. Sir. Well, you know, on the Street, right. near the that capture zone. It's hard to see. 
seeing them on the map there, but it was kind of really sort of getting a kind of small area. And I was wondering if there was a yeah. in your model yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the that's the yeah. Your model, why is it that prevents that capture zone from going further to the south and going beneath with a full uh, and, and 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 partly let's just uh that mo that the well in this model gets its water out of induced recharge from the bottom of Tanner's Creek. That's why it doesn't extend all the way. But that's based on assumptions about the properties of the bottom of Tanner's Creek. So there's every all of these things can be checked. You don't have to guess about that, and you can actually d determine by putting a piezometer next to that well while it's picking on and off. You can determine how much water comes through, you don't have to guess, you don't have to assume. You can then est you can measure how much water comes through the bottom of the sediments, then you don't have to make assumptions that seem to work, which is what we did. The direction I think is, is, is correct. <coughs> we don't know how much is coming out of the creek versus how much is coming through the aquifer, and depending <coughs> on the scenarios we use, it could be more or less. So it's a good point, and it could come further south. The but the, the general need for the data is what would, I think, improve it rather than just change it. I think it needs to be improved with data rather than just try different assumptions. I think we should measure things. I think that a, an agreement between the or organizations, including LCD, would be <coughs> valuable too because I know you guys have spent a, a lot of money with Mondell and piezometers and mapping, you know, you know, water as the river pushes in. And so there's a lot of data out there that this cart, you know, compartmentalized. Right. That if we, if we work together, we could kind of share those things and get a better picture of the, the, the water resource. And, and I, I wanted to just say that, that the, the model that, that was developed here is consistent with work that uh, Mr. Carr has done. So there isn't really any argument in terms of the way that we both generally see the, the story here. Um, which made me feel good because and someone else came to the, a similar conclusion. So I feel like, um, but that's the kind of interaction it, it takes is, is, is the conversations, uh, some kind of technical conversation as well, a discussion, and then the data that is used to supplement it. That's, that's the way that you can protect the system. I got a question, question Joe. On, on the, the other side of the coin about adding wells, what if MGP, which apparently this says it kind of protects us that well? Yes. What if they don't pump as much anymore? Their production is down, or you know, um, ten years from now, who who knows what can happen? What if they shut that well down? What kind of effect would that have on our drinking water then? What's great about a model is I didn't have to go ask them to turn it off and then measure what would happen if they did. I I was able to just turn it off in the model and look. And it turns out that there's enough flow coming from the north that none that the water in those wells are are still it still is mainly coming from the north in the in that line. Um, but that's the kind of experiment that you that the model can be used to do and look at. So in this case, I turned it off to evaluate it, but it it turns out that it's not the that's not the pr only thing that's protecting it. There's also this other, uh, but, it, but it does get into the question of, okay, what would it take to change this and make it um, change too much or in a way that we don't want it to change? And so I think that's, that's why you would want this group to be together, to ask those questions and have them in the room as well to see what, what other scenario should we try Etc. Joe. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, will, th <coughs> will this be shared with the IDEM? Because on Friday in their virtual filing cabinet, they had responses from the mitigation company. Kind of echoed what you're saying. They recommended, I can't remember technically exactly what they said, but they recommended more monitoring wells. I think seven more. Um, so I'm asking, will this be shared with IDEM? The sharing, I, I, I'm. This is the. So, so the hope is tonight that the board accepts this report 
and allows us to distribute this report, this report on our website, share it with the paper, obviously, and anybody else that would like a copy of it so that they can, they can read and go through it. And I would also like to say that this is just a starting point for us. This isn't, we're, we're not saying, hey, here's a report, we're done. Uh, we're hoping to continue the relationship, continue to monitor and track what's happening uh, in the wells and our well fields, uh, you know, from now on. Uh, it's something that we, you know, I can't stress it enough how much we're concerned about that. And, uh, and it's taken us a while to get to this point. Um, but here we are. So. And I, I would like to just add to, uh, to the idea of monitoring. The I you, there's so much going on with these wells pumping that you really need information at more than one uh, depth. You really need to understand where the water's moving and what the levels are at different depths because it's, <coughs> it's, it's a tight three-dimensional system. So you really do need, as they said, these, these stacked monitoring wells that have maybe three points in them that measure water levels at different depths. And you'd want to have them distributed around and in the vicinity of both the river and the pumping centers to make sure that you understood where they were, where, where water was moving and, and how fast, et cetera. Steve? We have to submit IDNR water withdrawal reports yes. every, every year. Should they not be involved in telling us when wells come in to Lawrenceburg or Green Duck? Because I just had a well come in over there by Giles and IDNR freely gives them a permit and you would think they would have some type of input to the local municipalities whether it's going to negatively affect us or not. Um, I think that if you formed this, I agree completely. Can, first of all, yes, you know, I think that's the right way. However, uh, by creating um, a multi-user water group and then you send an e a letter that to IDNR and IDEM saying from now on, I think you can instantly change the relationship by just asking. Um, in many cases, utilities and, and people are spread out, so it doesn't really matter. You do know about it. But here there's a, there are enough jurisdictions and users where you really might need the regulators to at least inform you. So I think that that's, the, that's where the future in Indiana is going, is a little bit more of informing everyone about the, who's using the water and how much. And, and to that point, you know, we, we didn't know that that well came into your community. And we, we didn't because you didn't tell us, not that you had an obligation to, but I think that the point is the communication between you and I sure. and Aurora, we just need to do a better job of it. Well, it was kind of shocking to me because I sat through the Mondell report and I thought this aquifer was, you know, it, it, what he just stated, how that it is, there's not enough Q coming into the yeah. aquifer. That well, it balances itself, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, <coughs> but it's not in right? it, it, it has It has limits, it has inputs, the, the rivers and, uh, interact with it. It really needs to be understood. And as you change withdrawals inside of this system, you're going to change flow directions. Um, and by the way, so far, it's great. So, I mean, so far, so good. Everything is going well. But it's now, before anything happens, you really kind of get a handle on it and start working on this. But one, one thing you have to be aware of, too, is there, there are things going on in the state of Indiana, like in the northeastern portion with Detroit, that is, it's really starting to ask the question about adjudicated water rights, who has the rights, these kinds of things. And, you know, if, if that ever developed in Indiana, our surest, best way to protect our resource is by knowing what it is, having mapped it, the amount that's there, the flows, <coughs> those kinds of things. So when people start to challenge that or want use of it, you have historical data to show what you've had, you know, and, and to not to protect that resource. A lot of that in southwest Florida, like yeah. Tampa, where there's holes where they pump so much to municipalities that there's just, there's no ponds left. And, so. and just to reinforce the point that Olin just made is that um, the first regional um, work on <coughs> regional water availability and future demand in the state 
is formed around the first group of utilities that got together and started having these regular voluntary conversations because they started figuring everything out. Well, they added up their future demand. They figured that out, and then they added up. They looked at each other's wells where they were for the first time. And everything built from there. And it was natural, it was voluntary, but it was regular. And that became a powerful voice <coughs> for kind of water management and I think that's what's, that's what's needed here. And, and whether or not you do it now, it is going to happen in the future. It will happen in the future, and it's part of what needs to happen. Um, so, Could you speak just a little bit to the, uh, the results that you've seen as far as the sampling that's been done on the, all of the area of potable wells? That the sampling that's been done to date? <coughs> to date, yes. So far, um, there, the water quality doesn't indicate that there's any any kind of contaminant that's reaching any of these wells. And I think that's important. Um, so I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, we're talking about numbers that are all below World Health Organization standards and very low levels. So it's not, I can't, there is no, that I can see there's no problem here. But I think that what I've been proposing is really how to move how to move forward and improve what you've got. I think that's always, that's part of your responsibility, I, I would think. And early identification if there, if there was to be a problem developed. Right, see it and know it. And, and you know, that was the other thing. I, I don't, I mean, as much as I'm working for the utility, I don't really care that I'm working for the utility. I'm gonna tell you all what happened, what the real reality is. That's the <coughs> only way I can do what I do. I, I have to just say this is where, where the water's coming from, that's that. And um, the same with water quality and all the other metrics. I mean, this is just, these are, this is physics. It's, to me, it's not politics. I mean, but I have to inform you for this, for the public policy side, for you. Um, but water quality is good. And water quality hasn't been damaged in any way. so. That's another piece of information that corroborates the flow lines and shows that water's coming, the water, it's good water, basically. Thanks. Yep. <coughs> Thanks, sir. We've, we, we've got 156 relief wells and seismometers and monitoring <coughs> wells. We, we probably got more wells in this small little area than there is anywhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Can you get information out of the type of wells that we have? Possibly. I mean, there are new tools that exist today that didn't used to exist. There are, there, there's a company called Well Intel that puts sonic water level measuring devices on any abandoned well or piezometer, and that feeds all that into a um, kind of a, a, a dashboard that for, for instance, Andy could look at and work with. So, or all of the utilities could work with together, for example. So, so you can see how when the river comes up, how fast the water levels come up below and where they come up. There's a lot of, of uh, misunderstanding usually about w how water level changes in the river translate in, up into the aquifer and how, how that kind of uh, wave or, or lag time occurs and how when it falls, how it goes the other way. So you could sort all that out just by plugging in and making um, accessible the data from the wells <coughs> that you already have. So it may, might be cheaper than, than it would be if you didn't have those wells. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Information. <coughs> so you want something, uh, you want a yeah, motion I like, to yeah, share I like, this with the... Uh, I'd like permission to be able to distribute this with the public, share this with the public. Get that in the form of a motion. So move. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Mr. Alvarez, <coughs> Seagram's Landfill Closure Plan.
board members, thank you for allowing me to come in. Um, we were, um, I, my name is Jim Alvarez. I'm a, a senior consultant with soil materials and engineers out of uh, Indianapolis. Uh, we do have a small office over in New Albany as well. Um, and we're currently, we're very familiar doing work in Dearborn County and, and the surrounding area. Uh, Olin uh, brought us in to kind of look at the history of the landfill and to look at closing uh, the former Seagram's fly ash land, landfill, what that would look like. Um, I think he had indicated earlier that uh, it's a regulatory obligation. IDEM knows it's there, so it's something that's been talked about for several years, and it's just a matter of going through the process. Um, so I think the, there was a brief handout that was hopefully passed on to each of you. I'm just going to kind of summarize and go through that um, and try to get, do this here. relatively quickly. We've been here for a little while. Um, but some, you know, a little bit on the history of the landfill. Uh, Seagram's uh, was authorized by the state of Indiana in the early 60s to start disposing of its boiler ash uh, uh, material in, into the landfill. And that's all that's ever been, to our knowledge, that's ever been disposed of in the landfill. Um, in 1991, uh, they started talking with IDEM about actually closing it. So that's how long these discussions have been going. Uh, in 1994, the landfill stopped. They stopped putting any more material into the landfill. And then in 2006, the I think I've heard uh, the uh, utilities bought the landfill for a dollar. Um, so. One of the things that uh, has been done, they have tried to go through somewhat of a closure on the landfill, the, clo the physical process, which is putting a cap on the landfill so that uh, they try to uh, prohibit the continued leaching or potential leaching of, of fly ash uh, that, uh, that's encapsulated there. Um, we took a walk with representatives from IDEM, um, Solid Waste, uh, about, uh, about two, three months ago. We walked around the landfill with, with Olin and one of your colleagues. Um, so in general, what we saw, without getting too specific, that the, the cover that's currently there, it's pretty much intact. Okay, the, however, in walking around the perimeter, kind of the top, from the top elevation going down the slope about 10 feet, it has eroded, and it looks like there has been some concrete, there has been material that's been put there to try to kind of slow down the erosion or stop the erosion. But you can tell over time, it's just starting to erode more. Um, and again, you know, the representatives from, uh, they, these were the landfill closure folks with, uh, with IDEM. They saw it, they looked at it, you know, it's like, oh, you know, at least you guys put an effort. Um, but, you know, they also understand that there, uh, that there needs to be more do uh, to be done. So in kind of going through the landfill closure process, uh, we had three meetings w with IDEM, um, and uh, that included the Indiana Brownfields program folks, as well as their solid solid waste folks. There are a probably two or three different regulatory programs that we could take to take this the, to kind of carry the process through. Um, the most economical at this point, and really, that's going to give you all the most. Um, control over the process is to carry this through the Indiana Brownfields program. Um, they're a federally funded program here in the state of Indiana. So for example, if you went through the voluntary remediation program, there would be a cost. You would pay them to review everything that we would do. Indiana Brownfields program, that doesn't happen. So that there is no cost from the program to oversee uh, what we're doing to go through the closure process. So in you know, in those discussions, kind of the, the rollout of the, uh, of the meetings that we had, um, the recommended clo closure process is the first thing that we want to do is do a very detailed cap or cover integrity analysis, assessment, really kind of walk through, walk the whole landfill, um, make sure that the, that, you know, where the cap is, <coughs> is weak. We already know some of the areas, but look at some of the areas that also need to be addressed. Um, develop a kind of a repair and management plan moving forward. A lot of that is going to be impacted by what the development, future development opportunities are going to be for the landfill. I think one of the, was it Odnell? Odnell, sorry. Your father was Odnell. Uh, Mr. Odnell 
talked about there is an, uh, you know, potential for putting the utility uh, LMU offices there. That would, be a, that would be a great use. That's very doable um, based on, on the historic use of the landfill. Um, so once we kind of, you know, you and, and would determine what the, or have some thoughts on what the actual end use, we would present that to the Brownfields program um, and then basically present the, the, uh, our analysis of the cap and what it's going to take to, to put the cap back in place. Um, if there is going to be a building that's going to be occupied, like an office building, um, they will want us, and they'll ask, they've already asked, uh, we would have to do some soil sampling within the landfill itself to look for volatiles. Again, just for any, any type of potential brownfield site, they're going to work, they are going to want us to look at um, vapor intrusion. So any, but any building that's occupied, just make sure we don't anticipate any issues based on what's been disposed there. But again, you have to verify and prove to IBM that that's not going to be an issue. Um, and then um, also look at the uh, geotechnical stability of the soils. So, and that really, that was a big issue with the solid waste, one of the engineers. If you're going to put a building here, you know it's a landfill. Let's make sure if you're going to put a foundation that the material is stable to support the foundation. Um, and really, uh, the, next, uh, the next step is um, to put a, a post-development monitoring program, which is probably putting in five groundwater monitor, monitoring wells around the perimeter of the landfill, monitoring that for a period of probably two to three years. And if the results come back as we anticipate, which is what the most some of the recent groundwater data that we've seen, we should be able to get closure within probably two to three years after the wells are installed. So, um, you know, this, this program, it, it meets with the IDEM requirements. We've been talking to them about them. And, uh, and you know, it's going to allow you to put a piece of contaminated property, or at least regulated property, um, back into reuse. Any questions? Now, does your plan going to have to include the, the new federal regulations that came down in August, um, similar to what they have to do over here with the port property? No, it was interesting that you, you mentioned that, because when I mentioned along Tanner's Creek, when we first kind of started the process, um, red flags went up. <laughs> yeah, and then when I, when I indicated that wasn't the site we were looking at, then they were, they were, they were okay with that. Okay. Yeah, th those regulations, maybe they are uh, specific to what that piece of property was being used for. But that, that was one of the first questions that were raised. But um, uh, it, does anybody have any questions for Jim? Uh, like I said, it's something we, we have to do. I mean, we're mandated to do it. And so I, I think if it's okay with the board, we'll just continue developing the plan and ultimately bring that plan forward for approval. Make a motion that we'll continue with the process. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Next item, Mr. Mel Davis, utility board structure. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. What, what I uh, am proposing and want to talk about this evening is uh, separation of the utility board from the political process. Um, I feel it's necessary. It's uh, when I was utility director, it was recommended to us for it was recommended to us three times by the State Board of Accounts uh, was never implemented. But uh, I would like to uh, ask the board to have uh, Mr. Nyberger uh, proceed with the investigation of how this could be accomplished, uh, what the benefits would be, and what the negatives would be. So when you say the separation, so that means no city money going into utilities? Correct. And no elected officials, except maybe for the mayor sitting on the board. Well, we already had one discussion on rates increases that if we did that if the city did not subsidize the utilities then our rate increases were going way up mm -hmm. so if we do this the rate increases will be tremendous on the utilities for the citizens uh, I we've already passed the electric 
And the water, Tony. No, we passed the electric for one commercial customer. We did nothing with the water. Well, the utility is going to be fine. What you have to understand is if you're going to operate utilities, eventually the money that we're going to, that we're using right now to subsidize the utilities is going to leave. Uh, one way or another, it's going to leave. You have to have the utilities stand on their own. This this utility, these utilities have been here for 110 years, 15 years? 118. 118 years. If we want them here for another 118 years and have the customers enjoy the benefits that they're getting, we have to take the proper steps, in my opinion, to ensure that the utilities are here. You, you, it's our customers, the owners of the utility, are being dealt a false hand right now. The costs that are incurred by the utilities is not the true cost that they see because of the subsidization. True. I wouldn't call it a false hand, but well, they are being subsidized by the city because you have the municipal, municipal development fund and all the, the other funds that help pay for the infrastructure of our electric, our sewer, our water which keeps the cost down, which keeps our rate down. If yeah. you take away any money that the city's giving to the utilities, and yeah. the utilities are not self-supportive right now, except for the electric, the sewer was going to go up 80%, wasn't it? Wasn't that the No, it had gone up uh, $2.58 per customer. That was, that, that was the agreement down. But well, we proposed, we, we it proposed was a lot more. Well, we never proposed or advocated for one rate over the other. We said there's two options. Uh, so this board's prerogative, which one they want. One of them was an increase of 21%, uh, which would have been $2.58, under three bucks per customer. And the other was one that was, uh, was much higher. But the one we brought back for approval was, was the lower rate. With the subsidization from the city, and that's why no, we can there was do no, that. There was no subsidization with the city in the lower rate. Correct. That would have ended the subsidization. Well, anyway, that's that's what I'm asking for. Another reason, if you all think about this, some of our owners um, do not live in the city limits of Lawrenceburg. Some of the co owners of this these companies don't live in the city limits of Lawrenceburg. They have no voice in who gets to sit on the board right now. They they don't. They're not represented. And I, personally, I don't think that's fair. That's my opinion. That's why I'm at, I'd like to see Mr. Nyberger investigate the pros and cons and come back to us with a report. Well, Mel, Mel. Yes, sir. I don't think it's fair that we're coming into our last year in election and we're trying to do this now. It'll be dumped on the next administration either. If the next administration wants to do it, let them do it. I well, don't think that we need to. Uh, okay, we I need to be dumping something what, on them. Now that's that's all. I understand I what you're saying, that. Randy, right. but this is my last hoorah. So, <laughs> this has been bugging me for a long, long time. But, uh, one thing that I think is an important distinction to understand is, no matter what board serves over the USB, the authority to raise rates is always going to be it's vested always with in the council. council. Period. That that never changes. Council will always have the rate or the legislative the, body. They always have to vote to approve. That can't change. I think what Mel's talking about is up, having down. A, a board constituted of other people who, who maybe have more interest or more knowledge, not, not that you all don't, but diff, different people involved in the day-to-day the -day of the utility, the management and running the utility. It's not an uncommon thing in the state of Indiana. Um, you know, Crawfordsville has that same setup, Anderson, several others. And so, that just for what it's worth. Greg, points the board. Correct me if I'm wrong, Greg. There's two, two, two different ways you can do that. It, it's, it, you could, you could, uh, you could dissolve the utility board and have a five-person board of works. Yes. Correct. And then the other is to keep board of works the way we have it and and appoint a non-political board. Is what that's I think where you were going. Is exactly, that right, Your Honor? And. The re my reasoning for that, you know, um, within our 
the customer base. We have a lot of uh, bright people and a lot of good business people. Uh, some of them are <coughs> engineers, some of them aren't, but there are a lot of good business people there. And I think that if a person has a unique interest in the operation of the utilities, then he or she ought to have the right to apply for the board, be appointed for the board, elected for the board, ever, whatever way works. But I think it takes a, um, a person that's truly interested in the operation, not necessarily minute to minute operation, but the operation of the utility companies. Um, you know, I've worked in a couple cities before, prior to coming to Lawrenceburg, one with a board, one without a board. Um, the one with the board worked more efficiently. Uh, you guys still have control of the rates. You still have control of approving the budget or not, you know. But it takes the political pressure off of the utilities, takes the utility pressure off of the elected official. You know, if I ask Randy Abner, what goes into a cost of service study? He doesn't have he he yeah. doesn't have a clue. But he's still going to vote on what the outcome of that cost of service study is. So if you get people that are truly interested in that aspect of what goes on in this town with these ut utility companies, I think, in my opinion, uh, we're all going to be better off. And like I say, Randy, this is my last hoorah. I, uh, I, I could have waited till December, but you know that's that's a little late. So I I want I went asking the board to allow Greg to proceed with that study, come back with some logical conclusions, pros or cons, and present it to the board for our consideration. That's what I'm asking for. He's sitting here not doing anything anyway. Let's put him to work. You know. <laughs> Any other comments up here work. about that? I have one question. Yes, sir. Um, such a decision, what what board or entity is that? Is it left up to? Is it the city council? Is it the board of works? Is That's what I want Mr. Nyberger to find out. There's, there, there's a lot of different ways. The mayor mentioned two of them. Okay. You can also elect a board. You can also take applications for a board. Uh, you know, it's, I think, our decision of how we do it, but my point is, let's take the politics out of that and take the utilities out of the politics. That's, that's my whole point. All for that. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to make Mel's a motion? Mel's making a motion? Yes, I will. Second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Nay. Aye. We need a roll call. Board member Tony Abbott? Nay. Board member Aaron Cook? Nay. Board member Mel Davis? Yes. Board member Randy Abner? Yes. Or no. Nay. Nay. <laughs> nay. nay. Board member nay. Paul yes. Seymour, Jr.? Yes. Motion fails 2 3. Well, I tried, guys. Now, I'm not saying that I won't try again before That's fine. December. <laughs> that is fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, looks like, uh, oh, any other new businesses? What not? No, Your Honor. All right. Uh, old, uh, the other old business we have is Moose. You got an update? Mm -hmm. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. He's right there. On the uh, event center slash Hollywood fiber update? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, the only update I have on the, uh, on the fiber is we are uh, waiting uh, for a response from the casino and uh, I've reached out to them I know that uh, the items we discussed uh, in our previous meeting are contingent on them uh, signing a uh, DIA contract sure. so okay. uh, I've reached out to them uh, actually this morning to see where they were at and I, I have not heard back yet who'd you reach out to uh, Ryan, Ryan Coppola okay. you, you want me to help, help with that uh, that's that's at your discretion, sir. Um, okay, if I reach out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I I think that's a great project at the event center there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, so um, we're just waiting on it. If you'd love to, I would. I'd be happy. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, All sir. Right. Okay. Any other old business? I have one. Yes, sir. The rodeo budget. Since we're getting ready to do this again, we have a budget from the utilities. We have a budget from the clerk treasurer, and they don't correspond. I'd like to set up a meeting, an open meeting, and go through it line by line so we can get this all straightened out. I'll just I'll let you know, Tony, the budget that I proposed to you, all of those numbers were verified by an outside third party source. I, I, I know. I, I don't want to argue about that one on because it, I can go from Rich and Rich will say, well, this is from the Indiana State Board of Accounts. This is what they're saying. Let, me, let, State, let, me, let me clarify yeah, that's that. Want everybody. Let me Tony, let me clarify that. That is not from the State Board of Accounts. Olin no, he said, said that I thought was. it was from no, the, no, State, no, no, no. the State Board of Accounts. That looked is not into from it. the State Board of Accounts. No, it was I looked into it based on what Olin had presented on a monthly basis throughout 2018, and he had a prepaid rodeo expense account. He put things into the prepaid rodeo expense account, and then later some of that was reclassified. That's correct. The claims that you approved during the year of 2018 added up to the numbers that I had. I sent that to Umbaugh. Right. They looked at those figures. So to say that the State Board of Accounts is totally inaccurate, and uh, you made mention of that in your letter, which is well, totally no, no, accurate. No. I, I made mention that the request wasn't made by State Board Correct. of Accounts. Correct. Correct. That it, it was not made, made and right. it was not produced it by the State Board of Accounts. And it doesn't coincide with what Umbaugh, Umbaugh's is. Well, let I let me, just want to get everybody get together and get it settled. Let me, let me add to, this. Can I add sure. one other thing? <laughs> I do have a letter that I wanted to pass out, and I also wanted to commend Olin and the LMU staff because what they've done over the past, I don't know, month and a half or so, they have provided for us budget to actual reports. They provided us with budgets for the utilities. They have done an amazing job giving us the financials recording that we need moving forward to get everything handled. Now, I still disagree on the rodeo numbers. That's we probably won't see eye to eye on that. Going forward, what I would like to see is just a budget, which I think you said you presented that to Tony for the rodeo. If we just had a budget for the rodeo, and maybe if if and, the and if there were lines of informal communication open between LMU and between the clerk treasurer's office, we would have never had these issues, correct? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think we're working on that, right? We are. And I, I'll say this, Tony, some of the things that, that Richard couldn't have known because, quite frankly, we weren't talking about it, is some of the expenses that went into rodeo, uh, cameras, for example, you're roughly $19,000 of that. Those were cameras we did use for rodeo that we tracked for that, but they were also repurposed and sold to LCD for their security camera system. And so it didn't wind up staying on the books for rodeo. Richard didn't have the context to know that. I hadn't talked with him to explain that to him. We've since gone back and explained that. Uh, are there are still some charges that we do disagree on. You, we we may, agree on that at least. Agree to disagree. Well, would it would it be okay? What if well, I think Tony wanted to have a just a meeting to go over those? Face, get it all done, go line by line, and get those guys on the same track, and no more arguing about it. Because I'm looking at one here that says 150 thousand. I'm looking at one here that says 379 thousand. Well, and I think Colin put together the last report, which well, was in the actually the last report you got was put together by Crow. Crow put together the last report, so that would have been in the packet that was passed out on the 18th. Right. So you have access to that. And we have oh, sent all those yeah. copies. We've communicated all those, all that information with State Board of Accounts. Uh, they've reached out with us and and told us that they appreciated the information and that they would look forward to meeting with us sometime in the future, but it wouldn't be until May. Yeah. Well, what I would like to come up with is a number you guys agree on so that citizens, when the citizens out there come up to me and say, you spent $700,000 on a rodeo, no. I can say, no, we didn't. No, no we spent right that much on the Fall Black Fest. Black and white, this is how much we spent. This we is spent how a little over 500000 on the Fall Fest, but I still, Fall you didn't Fall include Fest. the cost That's to set up the tent or take down the tent. No. I've well, numbers. You know, in the way that we account for things, we have, we have structures and monuments that we put those costs into. The building was bought under the agreement that we set it up, it, and so that was an understood cost that we had. But but, but even, it was still, even, would even the tent have been set up had there not been a rodeo? Hey guys, can we do this at our special meeting? 
Well, I didn't want to schedule. We can schedule. It would have. Thank you for your question. We can set. We schedule. You would have still set the tent up if there hadn't been a rodeo. Absolutely. For what though? For whatever the utility decided they want to set it up for. We'll never set that up except for one time. Mel, not you're sixty-four thousand dollars. Thank you. Uh, thank you. While we're talking about numbers, my last two rows. I would like to get an speak up. Speak up. I would like to get an actual number, an actual number, including overtime, all the other expenses for the fall fest. I I just like to know for my benefit. Okay. You can you, you can whisper in my you can whisper in my ear or whatever. I just want to know what the number is. It's uh, public. Okay. Yeah. She's got a, a Okay. Hey Tony, it sounds like they're on the right track. I, they're working on it. They're how about we let them do a little more talking cuz I ain't of no help. If you guys can't work it out, I ain't going to be any help. Well, Richard and I can continue to talk about it, but one thing I'll tell you for sure, if, if we did something or mishandled money or did something incorrectly, no, we, we, have, we have communicated everything with state board accounts. No. no, I'm saying if we had, they would certainly bring that out, draw attention to it, and they would demand that it was corrected. They'd well, here, issue a but let, let me say this. I am not implying no. to any degree that Olin or LMU mishandled money. But here's what I'm saying. If we go through it, council goes through it with them such and we see well we spent 40,000 on doing this maybe we can say hey let's let's not do that that's 40,000 we can say we don't need to advertise over here or over there or do that I mean that's just an example there could be other things in there hey let's not spend this 50,000 let's not spend this 70 maybe we can get it down to a good working number that everybody agrees with hey I I'd, I'd like to see you get interested in the Lyman rodeo I sat over there for two days and did not see anybody well, I no, did Randy not see you at Fall Fest. No, Mel was I, there. I, I want you to get interested. I didn't see you at Fall you know Fest. We can the switch this year. We it's Fall Fest, so Aaron is out of town. somebody complains. <laughs> it, I'm just saying, these guys are working it out. We don't need to do that in front of everybody here. I don't want to sit here. You guys work it out, and we'll come to the next meeting and see if we have if well, we have anything uh, worked I don't out. have what? any problem at all sitting down with Olin. I, yeah. I would love to sit down with what Olin, Colin, myself, maybe Dan. Sure. and just discuss this. But That's I fine. do want to make sure that we bring it back to the public because I know there's people out here that do care about this. Yes, I don't have any problem with Well, we can bring it back, but, but I'll be in there. I trust you, you to work it out. The reason why we hire people is so they can do their jobs. I don't want to give these people the impression that me sitting up here is going to make anything change between their numbers. I don't want to come here one night and spend three hours for a reason that I, I ain't. Okay. You two work it out. Let's, let's, let's do this. Let these two work it out. Yeah. Then we'll have a work session. You I can, trust you. You can Both present you. what you got to us with the with Ola the public. and I come back there. together with a report. Bring, bring us a report with the public here. That sounds good to me. And if there's additional discrepancies, then it can be discussed. Yeah. Is that right? We're busy people. We can let these two do their jobs. Right. I, I understand that part, I'm but I just want to hear what they got to say. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Denny either wants to talk about it now or maybe comments from the audience, whatever you want him to do. He wants to talk about this issue. He contacted me earlier today. This is the it. last yeah, he called me to. thing to I, anybody wants to talk, talk. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tim Denning. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight, first of all, I want to say uh, what I've heard tonight, I feel like I'm a smarter man now than I was when I walked through that door. I thought this gentleman's presentation about the aquifer, that was very enlightening to me, fascinating stuff, uh, and I appreciate it. Um, on, a, on a not so positive note, I got a couple of questions. Go back to the agenda, presenter Dell Weldon topic payment agreement. You all decided to make a payment. I'm assuming you're pay making that payment with taxpayers' dollars. I'd like to know who and what that amount was paid for. Is that a problem? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We didn't. We're not making a payment. We <clears throat> we lost a court case court said that we had to pay money back so that's pretty much it 
Uh, the way that the court case came down, I think everybody in the room can agree that the ruling that came down on the UCC code was particularly hurtful to the utility, to not just Lawrenceburg, but any utility. Uh, that code says that if we issue a bill to you and we made a mistake and said that there was a $20,000 credit on the bill to you, you could say that we owe you $20,000, that you have a credit. There would be no forgiveness for us making that mistake. We negotiated with Dell, Greg, the ability to have that ruling overturned, to vacate that ruling, which is a problem for the utility. There was, there's no additional monies that we have to pay. The court said we have to pay this. We just used the opportunity to negotiate undoing bad law. Well, the way it was presented, it was very tactfully danced around how much money it was and who we were paying. And all, that's all I wanted to know. How much money is it and who were we paying? Uh, we're paying roughly $41,000 to Dave Laurie and Jim Schwer. I'm sorry, you're paying who? Dave Laurie and Jim Schwer. Okay. How much money? $41,000. We. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. I don't want to know the details. I was just kind of sitting there thinking, gee, it was kind of danced around about who we're paying, and why is that a secret? You're using my money to pay it. I want to know who it's going to. Wasn't that money that they paid us that we ever billed them? No, no, no if, lack if of we, a better word. If we're getting into it, uh, you know, if we want to talk about the details of it, when the when the plaza was built up here at the top of the street where Whitey's Liquor's at, for a number of years, <coughs> never had hey, a Owen, uh, and Tim, that's a fair question, and uh, Owen's doing a good job. It's a it's a public lawsuit. You can look it up uh, as, as far as the pleadings are concerned, the ruling uh, from the court. Those things are all public. Uh, but as far as kind of discussions that Greg and I, as legal counsel, have to have with the city in terms of strategy or, or why this was beneficial, some of those things can't be discussed in public. Some of them can. You know, we I think we've discussed as much as we can or should. But we made a payment. Owen told you the amount of the payment and told you who the plaintiff was. I think we gave even more details. It's the dispute over a, a utility bill that occurred some time ago. Um, and, and again, everyone's free to go to the public portal, look at the pleadings related to the case, but obviously we can't discuss everything here. You gave me all the information I asked for. And that's that's a, fair, and it's a fair it. question. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Now, the other thing I want to address is uh, sometimes you have to sift through all the technical stuff and, and look at things in a, in a basic layman's viewpoint. And tonight I saw presentations of well over a million dollars invested in a new building. Uh, don't know how much the other investments were on some additional buildings for the Lyman's, but obviously the uh, Carpenter's building is well over a million dollars or close to that. The Lyman building is going to be a lot of uh, considerable amount of money. There's questions on how much money uh, was spent on a rodeo. What I saw was $530,000. Uh, and you add all that up in your mind, and then no more than a month or two ago, I heard a request for a rate increase. And I'm like, guys, one minute, you're saying, I got all this money, I'm going to spend a million dollars on this building, and it's going to have a dining room, and it's going to be beautiful. And then the next minute, you're saying, hey, Mr. Uh, Ratepayer, we're going to raise your rates. It doesn't make sense, guys. Can I, can I try to explain? Go ahead. So you have, you have different utilities, water, sewer, electric, fiber, and so forth. They're, they're fund appreciated, so meaning how we deal with those. Each one is separate. All of the revenues that are made on water and sewer have to go towards water and sewer, or water to water, sewer to sewer, electric to electric. To say that they're all three in the same health or you know, condition financially is inaccurate. The electric department, just like any electric department, anywhere in any city that has an electric department, always makes the lion's share of the money. That's just the way it is. Um, I don't know why it's that way, it's just the way that it is. Probably because most times the electric department also funds city operations. Um, last utility that I was at, 40% of our total net sales funded everything in the city. Library, all the pay for city, everything. 40% of it went to the city. Some other cities have similar arrangements. Some of them are less, but, but to some extent, the utilities has always been the strongest um, 
part of the city government in terms of being able to pay. And I think even here in Greendale or Lawrenceburg, before the boat, I believe the utilities paid the bills here. Is that not correct? And so when the city would get its tax drop, it would repay the debt back to the utility. So when we talk about the utility's ability to do things, um, one of the first things I did when I came here was establish a budget, looking around at the needs that we had, uh, thinking about the fiber optic systems, those kinds of things. And without raising rates, we started putting money in a savings account, just like anybody else can do, and putting that money aside so that we can buy trucks, which we've done without going to NBF. We've paid for those trucks out of the revenues that we make as a utility, um, fix buildings, fix repairs, buy equipment, all those kinds of things. We do ourselves so that we aren't a burden to the city, so that we don't go to NBF and ask for money to do this, or do that, to do projects. <coughs> Major projects that, you know, that are millions and millions of dollars, most cities bond those. They go and they take on debt. Uh, here, we've been fortunate enough to be able to do these projects using MDF money. Um, the rate increase that we talked about, there was some talk about the utilities being self-sufficient. And what we mean by that is if my guys have health, health insurance, I'd like for us to make that rate based and not make it a burden on the MDF or on Civil City. If my guys uh, derive some benefit, whether it's whatever it is, I'd like for that to be rate based. So that when you pay your utility bill, every time you pay your utility bill, you'll know that no matter what happens on the tax side, no matter what happens on the civil city side, your, your utility company is always going to be whole, stable, and able to provide the same quality of service that we have for 100 years. Um, when it comes to buildings, take a look around at the inventory that the buildings has, the city has, and where our employees are. And, and I welcome you to go down to the electric department and... See where those guys are at. You've got, you've got 12 guys crammed into a, an old, literally an old sewer tank. It's got a wooden floor built over what used to be a holding tank. Uh, ceiling leaks. You know, they shouldn't be in that building. You know, these are guys that are extremely important to us. All the utility guys are. They should have a, a place that they can work out of that is, that, that's worthy of that. We have that same respect for the police department. We have the same respect for the fire department. But, you know, utility guys, I think they deserve the same kind of place to work out of. They work hard and they provide us a, a real service for us. And so some of those plans speak to that. <coughs> the new utility building, you know, we, uh, this building just doesn't work very well. Uh, we've, got, we've got people kind of double stacked in offices. Um, this building, if for it to work well, would, would need a substantial amount of money invested in it to make it work well. And so I think all we're trying to do is, is present some, some potential solutions. None of it's etched in stone. None of it got approved. We're just trying to, to, to give the public and this board options as to how we might best take care of the city's resources, the city's employees, and future assets. Well, I don't want to make this meeting any longer. Uh, I could talk to you about for hours about my idea of what your job is and how it should be managed and <clears throat> what you should be doing and that wouldn't be fair to these people sitting here but i'd love to do that sometime i think you do a hell of a job don't get me wrong i i like you as a person i think you do a wonderful job at our utility department but my god Owen, it seems like you got an open checkbook to me and that's disturbing to me other than that i think you're doing a super job and we hired all these gentlemen to manage you and I'm more disappointed in these gentlemen than I'm are of you because they're managing that checking account. And from what I've seen, you've, you've got an open checkbook. And tell, shame tell, on these people. Tell me something that I've spent money on that I shouldn't have or that I didn't make them aware of. Do what? What have I spent money on that I didn't make them aware of or th they weren't aware that we were buying it? From what I know, $530,000. We didn't hundred. spend 530000 I, I don't know that. And, and, and we, we spent, according to our calculations, about 170 And of that, we raised over $100,000 from people outside of this community. I don't know. And we brought $250,000 worth of business to the event center. But nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about inaccurate numbers that got given to them with ill intent. But the reason any number makes people angry, because just two months ago, you talked about a rate increase 
And I know the way you explained it, I understand it completely. But to the rate payer out there that gets his tax bill and say, damn, my utilities went up again. And darn if they don't have a brand new building on Short Street. I'm paying for that building. That's what the rate payer feels and sees. Well, and I, unless you've got a means to communicate thoroughly definitely. to the rate payer, you're making a mistake. Well, I, I think that's what we're trying to do here tonight. No, no money was spent. We just talked about plans. We did it in a public venue, in full frontal, so everybody could see and talk about it, provide input, and I, I'm all for that. All right, we're good then. Thank you all. Next. Reclassify numbers anywhere that you want to reclassify them. They were still spent when you look at the claim and the description on rodeo. They, they may have been, but when I say the rodeo didn't get approved this year. I didn't say that. All of those poles that I put oh, in that we spent money on would go back into inventory. They could go back into inventory next year. Those poles are usable anywhere, anytime. $40,000 for Dale Brisbane. Hey, you guys are supposed to discuss this and get back to yes, it. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. And, and I'd like to remind people that we have an audit coming up, I think, in May. And I think all these questions will be resolved by the State Board of Accounts in May, if not before. The city also is mandated to have an audit. I'll, I'll add that the city is mandated because we did put those bonds out. So we'll be getting a bond as, or getting an audit as well from the State Board of Accounts. Hi, yes, Amanda Rainey. That's wonderful. Richard, when you were speaking about this earlier, I felt like you got caught off a little bit. So I just wanted to know if you could reiterate exactly what this is for people at home that couldn't exactly well, it's understand. It's just two things. It's I feel that we are in disagreement with the rodeo costs 100 percent. But I feel that we've also made strides in other areas uh, which are addressed in that. And I'm okay. putting that out there from a clerk treasurer's standpoint. So now, if Olin and I can get together and discuss this, we can probably come to some sort of a better understanding. But that's what I'm saying. From our standpoint, that is the numbers that we believe were spent on the rodeo. Okay. Um, and how does council feel about these numbers that were spent on the rodeo? Have you had time to look it over? We want to know what the numbers are. Uh, we just are. got it. We're getting two different stories. This is the first time asking, that you've got it. That's why we're asking them to get together. So are and you get going the right to numbers. present it to council at the next council meeting, or will this be discussed in a... Um, executive session no, this would not be an executive i think olin myself <coughs> we can and colin whoever else we can get together and see what we can hash out and then we can come back and present something okay but as of right now i am standing on this and this, but i am willing to sit down and discuss why i may be wrong and this includes all the totals in your opinion that includes the totals that were presented through 2018 on the monthly claim sheets that this board approved okay so that's all the questions I have about this. Councilman um, Mel Davis. Yes, ma'am. When you say that you want to vote on separating LMU from the city. Yes, ma'am. Why, when you were in office, why didn't you want to do it for you? I did. You did want to separate. I did want to do it. I couldn't get the council to go along with it. Now I'm But you did put it to I, council I and it didn't it, pass? I proposed it about five times. You don't times. think that your report with State Board of Accounts has anything to do on why you're wanting to make that vote happen? No. No. Okay, this is election year. Thank you so much. I'm not running, ma'am. I know you're not. It's probably a good thing. <laughs> you know what? I'm Bob Rival, and this has kind of been embarrassing. I had never seen a group throw everybody under the bus. <laughs> it, it just, it looks like it. One group's attacking Owen. Everybody's you know, I think he's done a good job. I don't know exactly, but let's let him tell, you know, about saving the money. You want to get into stuff about spending money? Look at Fall Fest and all that, all that money that goes out. You know, it just seems like everybody is throwing everybody under the bus. It reminds me of Cincinnati with that gang of five and all that. It's election year, Bob. And it's a joke, but <laughs> you're, you're right, but it is... It's almost embarrassing. And it, it's going to get worse next month. Just, oh, trust me. Just just read the social God, media. I don't know else. how people look at people and say hi because they don't mean it. Mind if I reply to that? If you want to go at Fall Fest, she has the budget right there. Every dollar spent. Okay? And right now, we have a clerk treasurer says one number. We have utility director says another. I'm asking them to get together and bring us one, a true one, so that they can work together and figure out exactly what the budget was. Nobody's throwing no accusations at him. So we're not throwing the oil under the bus. 
But what is the chances of them agreeing on the same thing? I well, hope it's a good chance because they're going to say, well, this happened, that didn't happen. And when they get together and talk, they'll find out what happened. But when, you, <coughs> when you're separate and you say this thing and he says that thing and they're not talking to each other, nothing's going to be settled. I would, I would hope you wouldn't want us to agree all the time up here. Well, no, but this tonight got a little, to me, it got out of control a little bit. That's just my personal opinion. But, you know, I hope we can come to an agreement on what, what is what, and it's not a stalemate. We'll find out the next meeting, won't we? All right. They'll be working together. Yes, sir. I have several things to say. Mike Lawrence, Olin. I'm not positive what the rodeo costs, but if it was a $19,434 loss compared to other things in this city, good job. I mean, you're at least close. You know, first time. So I commend you on that. Mr. Clerk Treasurer, that so seems like wants to act so perfect. Uh, you're the one, that, if you read the state statutes, uh, requirement for public records everything has to go through your million dollar city attorney that's inaccurate bull I got emails I I can produce those emails uh, I can't get the city attorney's bills without them being blacked out but the public mm -hmm. access counselor says I'm entitled no, the public Still don't have counselor does yes, not. Yes, he serve. does, sir. Sir, that, that man emailed you. Facebook. That man emailed and you, and I have that email from him. Sir, I'm talking right now. And I will produce that email on Facebook tonight for everybody to see. Thank Good. you. Good. And uh, the last thing is, you guys spend over half a million dollars a year in Fall Fest. And you guys want to talk about a $19,000 loss or whatever. Ain't none of you perfect. Come on. You know, have you looked at how much each year you've spent Lawrence, over I revenues have never, coming in? I have. No, Thank you. Your have numbers. I have never once, nor would I have ever imply that I am a perfect individual. I'll post that email, sir. Your Honor, because so you just said that I'm not telling the truth. Yes, sir. We adjourn. Be on Facebook tonight, sir. Can't. Yeah, we got to prove claims. Well, I just want to say something. <clears throat> I don't. I don't feel as if tonight was me being picked on. Um, quite frankly, you know, I'm the kind of person that I like to be asked the hard questions, and I, and I don't mind it. I want to have discussion. I want to have transparency. And so, if, and I and I don't want everybody up here to agree. If we all agreed, then one of us is the only useful person because the other has the same opinion. And so, I don't mind the hard questions. I don't mind the the talking back and forth about things because at the end of the day, when a decision finally is made. We can say that we've hashed it out and we we've worked through it and we've come to some kind of agreement. So I, I I don't mind. I don't mind that certain things get voted down or certain things get tabled. It just tells me that I've got some work to do to to help people understand my vision if I can, or change plans and do something different. So I, I don't mind it. I like it. Do I still get my sidewalk trees? You do. No. <laughs> no trees. <laughs> Yes, sir. I know it's late, so I'll make it quick, but I'll lighten it up a little bit. I was in Detroit 37 years, and I saw board meetings. People, <laughs> way out of hand, you can go watch them 10 years later on the Internet. It's pretty wild. Uh, books written about it. Um, I think I've got some good news, and I just want to share it because this is a thank you. Um, a council together and the leadership um, a couple of years ago helped pass a unanimous motion to be supportive of, I'm just a kid from Lawrenceburg trying to bring some jobs back home in a really booming industry. So I'm going to hand this over if you guys want to pass it down. This is a tweet that came out two and a half weeks ago from the Secretary of Energy uh, for the United States Department of Energy. Um, and Rick Perry wrote, hydrogen is an energy carrier that can unite our nation's abundant energy resources. And I want to tell you that um, we used city resources twice for an hour, less than an hour each time to do a grant request to a uh, grant to the DOT, too innovative, didn't fit the mold, pretty much knew that, wanted to go through the process. Last year we did another one uh, to a different grant at the DOT. 
Um, it didn't pass because it was still too innovative, but we have a resource at the DOT now that will help us write it beforehand, they've told us, for this year. However, the Department of Energy has a grant, um, and we're going to take advantage of that uh, motion one last time, or one more time, because this grant is for integrated systems, integrated production, storage, and fueling system of H2, of hydrogen, uh, and enabling R&D in hydrogen. And uh, I know Rick Perry. Uh, we have some other people. We've been in and out of D.C. a bit. I've even been out of the country on this project. So I just want to say that we'll probably spend less than an hour again to use your great grant uh, writing resources because it has to go through a municipality. And hopefully we'll hit a single, double, triple home <laughs> run. And the guy that they're, they say one day, whatever happened to that guy, we're just going to try to create jobs. I'll give you all an updated booklet as well. Thanks, that's Jim. Okay. If I can approach. Okay. All right, thank you. Pass these now. Yep. There you go. Pass it down. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're limited to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Everyone. He left it all out. Amen. <laughs> Don't do that, Gary. <laughs> okay. I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the claims. That move. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion will carry, and I need a motion to adjourn after two hours and 53 minutes. No, no motion? So, <laughs> I need a second. 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 All in favor. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Work. Uh, I didn't know how much to score him before I said something. Barma fan, no, but Barma fan. pretty close to the limit. I didn't want to shoot him. I just wanted to throw some other, other questions on.